live from Hollywood, California, DJ Vernon Husky, the Big Vanilla Funnies, unsportsmanlike conduct. Unsportsmanlike conduct. Yeah, 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 yeah. I played this joy to start the radio show in a minute. Good morning, everybody. Top of the morning. Beautiful sunny day out here in Hollywood, California. This is VJ's Unsportsmanlike Like Conduct coming to you live right now on Spreaker.com. Don't forget to check us later on the iHeartRadio app podcast of the shooters. The show's done here. It will be podcasted over there, iHeartRadio, for your listening pleasure. Great show for you guys today. Special guest, my man Luis Estrada, coming in at about 7.30 from Spectrum Sports and the Luis Estrada Sports House from Blog Talk Radio. And also the voice of Cal Poly Sports, Mr. Chris Sylvester, will drop in too to talk about his Miami Heat and then possibly land in West Westbrook. I'm your host, VJ Vernon Husky, a.k.a. VJ Writers, because I always think I am, a.k.a. the Big Vanilla Shack, a.k.a. 8515, a.k.a. the Blue Eye Barkley, a.k.a. the Creamy Kobe. Y'all know all the nicknames. VA's Top Talk Boy, Mr. Never Shut Up, the Big Vanilla Color Card, and y'all know I'm the Big Vanilla Color Card, because sometimes you got to deal the color card out, and I am your Big Vanilla Color Card D- Vegas dealer. I want to start today's show with my opening rant, as I always do. Free agency is hit. I have not done anything on free agency. I wanted to hold off. I wanted things to kind of be complete. I like for things to kind of play out. I'm not a guy that's got to be first. I'm a guy that kind of likes to analyze everything and just get it right. And now that free agency has pretty much played itself out, it's pretty much laid itself out. Everybody's with their new teams. Uh, You got the last scraggling Kind of, kind of scraggling players left to sign in free agency. Everything is pretty much set. We all know the big news by now. Kawhi Leonard, Jerry West, Lawrence Frank, Doc Rivers, in my opinion, pulled off the heist of the, the, the decade. I've never in my sports life seen anything like I just saw last week. With the way that Kawhi had everybody thinking that the Lakers weren't playing, And that Toronto was in play. And all along, he wanted to be a Clipper. He wanted Kevin Durant to come with him. Kevin Durant said, I want to play with you, but I want to do it with the Knicks or the Nets. Kawhi said, I don't want to go to New York. I just lived in the cold of Toronto. I'm cool on that. That's further away from home than Toronto is. I'm trying to move closer to home. I want to go back home. Everybody knows Kawhi Leonard is from Riverside, California. Shout out to UCR. Uh, school that my wife graduated from in the Highlanders out there. So we had this whole storyline that Kawhi Leonard was going to be a Laker. Done deal. Kawhi Leonard's going back to Toronto. 90%, 99%. And I'm not calling people out. That's so passe. That's been done. We know what reporters or analysts said what. There's no point in beating that down. That That's corny in my opinion. I've been a victim of that. I've been guilty of that before. I've graduated. I've matured. I moved on. Everybody's not going to get everything right. Fine and Danny, let's move on. But my mama always told me that change isn't always good, but a lot of times it's necessary. I'm not a super team guy, but I understand the super team era. It does give us a big villain to go after. The Avenger movies are cool. But they're much better when they're chasing Thanos. And Thanos is chasing the Avengers. Batman's cool. But Batman is so much better. When the Joker or Bane is in the storyline. It's okay with the Penguin. It's cool with the Iceman. Or Dr. Freeze or Mr. Freeze. Or whatever the hell his name is. It's cool with the Riddler. Jim Carrey did an awesome job as the Riddler. Danny DeVito did an awesome job as the Penguin. But nothing touches Jack Nicholson Joker. Nothing touches Heath Ledger's Joker. It's just better. I get it. You gotta have other villains. But there's always that one main villain. Lone Star is pretty cool when he's got to deal with Pizza the Hut. But when Lord Helmet is coming after him, it's a whole different ball game. 
when Spaceball 1 is coming after him, it's a whole different ball game. But sometimes change is necessary even though it may not be good. The one thing I will say about Kawhi Leonard picking the Clippers is I we, we will now dub Kawhi Leonard on VJ's Unsportsmanlike Conduct the Savior. He is the Savior. He actually saved next season's basketball. He, he single-handedly saved the season. Because anybody who thinks or anybody who wants to try to say that if Kawhi Leonard had went to the Lakers, that this season was going to be even worth watching with KD being out a year with the Achilles and then New York now with Kyrie, with 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 Clay Thompson possibly being out. January, February, I kind of got Clay out until if they're smart, all-star break, you get them back. By that time, they've been running pickup. They've been running full court practice. They've been doing some things. The ACL is not like what it used to be as far as injuries and sports go. Guys come back. Guys are okay. Guys are fine. We saw Adrian Peterson literally rip and shred his entire knee. They might have had to give him a whole new leg. And he came back and ran for 2,000 yards the next year and almost broke the rushing record. Now, I'm not saying Klay Thompson is AP. But in football, I think that ACL is a whole hell of a lot more important than the ACL in basketball, especially in today's game where uh, you can't touch guys as much. There's not as much physical play. I think we can all agree to that. So you got Clay out. You got KD out. If Kawhi goes to the Lakers, that totally washes the NBA season. I might not watch a lot of it. I'm always watch my Pistons because I love my Pistons. I'm always watch Steph Curry because I'm a fan of the Vanilla Bros. I'm a Vanilla Bro myself. I tell one of my mentors, Chris Broussard, all the time. When I text him and talk to him, I start almost every text with "Good day, good morning, good afternoon, my fellow Vanilla Bro." I rock with the Vanilla Bros. But Steph ain't gonna be able to do it by himself for long. Clay's got to come back at some point. But if you told me that you were going to put Kawhi with Braun and with AD and even some of the bench players that they have right now with Rondo at the point, with Danny Green shooting threes, looks like Cal Corver might be on his way also, another three-point shooter. And then you get Boogie, and I don't think Boogie's the same Boogie. I think Achilles is different for big guys. And in the finals, I watched the guy play one good game, couldn't jump two inches off the floor, and my daughter could run faster than him up and down the court. And she can't run at all. My children, I don't know what happened to the athletic bone. They didn't get it. They didn't get mine. They got their mamas, and their mamas didn't never play no sport. I was the athlete, and can neither one of my daughters run, jump, catch, shoot. Not, and that's not a knock. That just wasn't their thing. And my daughter could run faster than him up and down the court. But it would have created a super team that everybody would have hated. It would have created a super team for everybody to chase. And it might have made storylines better. I'm not sure it would have made the movie better. Change is necessary sometimes. It's not always good. But Kawhi Leonard, excuse me, the savior, he just saved next season's NBA season for me. And I thank him for giving older guys like me the opportunity to see this generation's players say, no, I don't want to go play with that guy. I want to beat that guy's brains in. And I know we sound like the old guy at the barbershop, and I try not to. I don't like to bang on my kids' music. I don't like to bang on my kids' TV shows. I let them watch. I monitor it. I tell them, hey, if this is what you're going to watch, this is what you're going to listen to, understand that there's a certain uh, there's a certain mindset that's going to come with that. There's a certain mind manipulation that comes with it. With it, Like with everything in life, there's a certain mind manipulation that's going to come with it. Just understand that. But at the same time, when I was listening to Public Enemy, my parents didn't really get Public Enemy. My parents didn't get NWA. My parents didn't really get LL Cool J and Run DMC and Grandmaster Flash and Salt and Pepper and MC Light. They didn't really get all those people. But they made sure I knew about Marley. They made sure I knew about Frankie Beverly and Maze and Earth, Wind, and Fire. 
They made sure I knew about Bootsy Collins. It's okay to have what you have in your era, but make sure you understand the history. And the history of the game is, I want to beat these guys. Mike, Bird, Cole, Duncan, Garnett, Barkley, Isaiah, Dumars. They wanted to beat the other better guys. They didn't want to go team up with them. Yeah, they had some great players. Yeah, Magic had Cap and Worthy and B. Scott. Yeah, Mike had Rodman at one point later in the three-ring run. The second set of three rings, Rodman. But in the early three rings, he had Pippen. But you can't tell me people were were fighting to get John Paxton and were fighting to sign B.J. Armstrong and were fighting to sign Bill Cartwright and Horace Grant and Stacey King and Brian Williams. Stop it. Don't tell me people were fighting to sign Randy Brown and Ron Harper. Ron Harper was a cast-off play. He hurt himself. He blew the knee. Nobody wanted Ron Harper. Phil said, nope, come on over here. Long defender, steady point guard, 8, 9, 10 points a game. Get on the boards, lockdown defender. Come over here. Mike needs that help out on the, on the perimeter. Mike's getting a little older. Mike can hope Mike can use that. What the super team. Yeah, you had Bird and Mikel. Parrish was old. Parrish was old. Parrish couldn't jump two feet off the floor, but he was a leader. He was tough-minded. He was tough-nosed. You need guys like that. If you go back to the Pistons and look at the Pistons, the Pistons was Zeke and Dumars. Rodman was a coming-of-age of a young player. You had Mark Aguirre. You had John Sally. You had James Edwards. Yeah, Bill Lambeer. Nobody was fighting to steal those guys in the offseason and try to trade for those guys or try to sign those guys in free agency back then. And they damn sure weren't calling each other in the offseason and hanging out saying, hey, let's all go hang out and let's all go construct a way to all come play together. And then let's go get that guy. And let's go, let's go get four of the top 12 guys in the league on one team and let's go win the championship. A lot of that has to do in my opinion, with the force feeding of a certain superstar in the NBA today through the media and through networks, and that's fine. I get it. You got to do what moves the needle. I understand. But change isn't always good, but it's necessary. And this, I hope, ends the super team era. And it sort of does. But I'm hoping it really ends the super team era. And that'll lead me into Summer League. Summer League, I'm just going to come out and say it as easily and as clear as I possibly can. It is a lot of average to bad basketball. And I'm going to tell you why. The one and done rule, and I was on record way back when the internet first really started and you could post things and say things and talk about things. I was on record as saying the one and done rule and high schoolers into the league was going to water down the talent of the league and eventually not crush the league, but really handicap the league. And look what we had between 2006 and 2016. I even just excluded the last three years and I went and I did some research and some number searching for myself on my own. Over a 10-year period of since 2007, how many one-and-dones have come into the NBA and how many one-and-dones were all-stars or even won championships? But that's why I think Summer League is so overhyped. You get the Zion game last weekend. Rightfully so. Okay, I get it. Bumps and in, out. Everything he does look just like Duke. Not a jump shot. He's getting beat on defense. They show the play over and over again where he steals the ball from Knox and dunks it. Number one, that's a foul. On, on, any, on any other given night in the NBA, the way the NBA is called today. Now, in my day, I, I that's the type of play it was. And I don't have a problem if it wasn't a foul. But stay consistent. Don't start changing your officiating now because you want to feed the story. You want to feed the narrative. You want to feed... The imagery. That's a foul on any other given night that I've seen the game called, the way I've seen it called, over the last 10, 12 years. But they show that play over and over again. They don't show Knox hitting jumpers on them. They don't show Knox who blocked them twice. 
They don't show where he didn't get back on defense. It's dunk, 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 dunk. Bumps a knee with a player, out for the rest of the summer league. There goes your summer league right there. Because you built it all on a one-and-done guy. Not the veterans that are coming back still trying to get a shot in the league, trying to live their dream, or the guys that really look NBA ready, i.e. Kobe White from Carolina, he belongs. R.J. Barrett, uh, I understand in Summer League, and we saw this from Trey Young last year in Summer League, where he struggled at first. But you can still see in his game from Oklahoma and the fact that he's just a pure assassin as far as shooting the ball. Sooner or later, those shots go in, people. They miss them at first. Nerves, nervousness, whatever you want to call it. But sooner or later, those shots go in. And they started to for Trey Young. And then look at the rookie year that he had. The questions that people had about R.J. Barrett in college are still right there. Now, I'm not going to say who works on their game or who doesn't work on their game. I'm not with these guys. But it doesn't look like that he's improved on the things that people said he couldn't do in college. I was very critical of his right hand. He has a zero right hand. Watch him in summer league. Everything's to the left. Nothing's to the right. And the shot that was and the dribble and the dribble pull up to the right last night was an air ball. To the point that you have sideline reporters reporting during the game. Don't worry about R.J. Barrett or the coaching staff. Is don't worry. Don't worry. This is going to be okay. He's going to be fine. When you have to do what I call damage control in the summer league, there's issues there. I don't know if there's smoke just yet because we know where there's smoke, there's fire. So I don't know if there's smoke just yet. But there is some issues that really need to be cleaned up there. Summer league is a lot of average to bad basketball. In the third quarter the other night, I saw a game where the score was 54 to 31 in the third quarter. Take it off of television. It's not needed for television. I listened to Vince Carter talk about when he came into the league, there was no summer league. So leading all the way up through the summer, he was still in Chapel Hill working out. Take it off of television. Take the spotlight off these kids. Have them look forward to opening night. Because if you've been the spotlight since the summer, what's really opening night now? They only run two or three games on opening night because they want everybody to be fixated on the defending champions getting their rings or fixated on this one rookie that's coming to the... I, I believe the opening night should be a full slate of NBA games. Every NBA team should have to suit up the first two nights of the league. The first two nights, everybody got to play. Back to back. Start it off right now. Let's go. Say college. Say the summer league. It say the G League. The D League, the Gatorade League, whatever it's called, whatever they call it, the, the Skittles League, the Snickers League, it's not that league. Let's go. Back to back nights. And then maybe give a few teams a night off or back to back night off. And then everybody maybe doesn't play on that third night. So there's no games on that third night. Start the league on a Thursday. And then have them play Thursday, Friday. Bam. And then take off Saturday. Saturday, there's still college football on. NBA starts at the end of October. There's still meaningful college football games on that Saturday night anyway. Give them the weekend off. There's NFL meaningful games at that point. The NFL people are fighting for playoff position. Fighting for division leads. Fighting for their lives. Fighting for, uh, uh, you know, tanking for the number one draft. They're, they're, you, you're talking late October, early November. There's a lot of meaningful football that weekend. Start the NBA on a Thursday night. Friday night. Bam, bam. Back to back. Wow. Bam, bam. Right there. It works. But if you want to go to the one and done, since 2007, 63 one and dones. That's the top 14 picks, okay? 63 one and done. That's 11 drafts from 2006 to 2000 and, uh, 2017. 2006 to 2017, 11 drafts. Out of the 63 one and dones, there has only been nine all stars. Nine out of 63 one and dones. Nine All-Stars. A.D., Drummond, Uncle Drew, John Wall, Boogie, D. Rose, MVP, Love, KD, MVP, Champion, and DeRozan. A.D., no ring. Drummond, no ring. Kyrie with a ring. John Wall, future is up in the air right now. Cousins, future is up in the air right now. DeRozan, got his feelings hurt, got traded. 
Rose, MVP, blew out his knee, never the same player again. Kevin Love, doing just fine in Minnesota, was averaging 27 and 15 until he decided that LeBron decided that he wanted him in, Toronto, uh, in Cleveland, never been the same player again. And then we know about KD. The one that done by year, just really quick, five in 2006, the, the big ones, Ben Simmons, Ingram, Jalen Brown, Marquise Chris, Jamal Murray. 2005, there were eight of them. Cat, D. Russell, Jaleel Okafor, Jaleel Okafor, not even in the league. Stanley Johnson on his third team. Justin Winslow, tell me where he is. Miles Turner, tell me what he's doing. Trey Lyles, tell me what's happening with him. And then, and then uh, Devin Booker. Devin Booker was 13. Devin Booker was almost out of the lottery. 2014, seven. Wiggins, Jabari Parker. What's going on with Jabari? What's going on with Wiggins? And B, 50-50 guy in my eyes. Does he want to be a star? Does he want to chase Rihanna? Does he want to really be an NBA like champion? He's an NBA basketball player. He's a great talent. That's fine. But dude, what, what do you really want to be though? You're still trying to figure out NB. Aaron Gordon, dunk champ, dunk, dunk contest competitor. Julius Randle, who I like. I like Randle a lot. I think he's going to be great for the Knicks. Uh, also, Zach Levine, dunk champion contestant. 2013, Bennett, we know that story. McLemore, we know that story. Steven Adams, Shabazz Muhammad, Norley's Noel. Listen to these names, people. 2012, AD, okay. Kill Gilchrist, Bill, Drummond, Austin Rivers. 2011, Kyrie, number one pick. Kyrie's done well. Enos Kanter. Enos Kanter's done okay. Trisha Thompson, eh. We're hearing more about him in his social life and his private life and the baby mama stuff and the Kardashian stuff than we are about him on the basketball court. Brandon Knight. Remember Brandon Knight out of Kentucky? Can somebody tell me where he is right now? 2010, Wall, Favors, Cousins, Xavier Henry, Xavier Henry, you guys remember him? I remember the Lakers cutting Kendall Marshall, who had just played 68 games for them, and damn near averaged the double-double, 10 and 10. They cut him to make a million-dollar exception room for Xavier Henry. Xavier Henry never dribbled a basketball in the NBA again. Smart move, LA front office. 2009, Tariq Evans, eh, DeRozan, okay. And I think the Rose is going to be better this year. I really do. I think the Spurs are very underrated about what they've done. I think a guy like Popovich is sitting around and kind of laughing and everybody's putting the Clippers and the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals. And a guy like Popovich is saying, okay, you keep it up. You keep it up. I'm going to keep showing you guys. We didn't have it together last year because we're still growing these young guys. You let these young guys come around this year. And I think it's going to happen. We'll get into that too also with the special guests when we break them in. 2008, D. Rose. We know about D. Rose. Michael Beasley, and, and I'm a DMV guy. I, I support anything that comes out of the DMV. I take it personal when people talk about Kevin Durant. I am a DMV guy. Football, baseball, basketball, hockey, acting, politics, I don't care. I, I support people that come out of my home area. That's the kind of guy I am. Beasley's from my home area. I saw Michael Beasley when he was 14 years old play basketball. OJ Mayo, and, and sidebar, I was an OJ guy. Because I was out here living in L.A. when I first moved here. I was just go watch O.J. play pickup ball and watch O.J. play at USC. And I went on a record, and I've said many times it was a mistake. And I shouldn't have said it. I was wrong. I thought O.J. Mayo was going to be better than Ke- uh, James Harden. I thought he was going to be better than James Harden. And I whiffed big time on that. Bayless, Anthony, Ra- uh, Anthony Randolph. 2007. KD. Okay, great. Michael Conley. Cool, but Michael Conley is, eh, you know, what, what is he? What is Michael Conley? He's, he's a really, really good point guard, but is he going to lead? We're going to find out this year. He's got a good team now. He can't blame it on Memphis anymore. We're going to find out this year. Brandon Wright, Spencer Halls, that is young. 2006, Tristan Tom, uh, Tyrus Thompson was, uh, was the only one that done that year, and he didn't even make the all-rookie team. He was second. He couldn't even crack the first all-rookie team. The one and done has not only watered down the NBA as far as player talent pool, it's, 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 it's made Summer League a sideshow. It's made Summer League a circus. It's made Summer League average to bad basketball. 
We're going to take a quick break. I'm going to bring in my special guest, my man Luis Estrada from Spectrum Sports. Really good sports guy, really good sports voice. Love this guy. We've done so many shows together. Uh, we, we talk sports time and time again. I've done his show. He's done my show. From Spectrum Sports, big Laker fan, so I am dying to hear his opinion on what he thinks what happened with the Lakers, the front office, Magic, Genie, Rob. Did, did LeBron get LeBron? Like, that's, and, and listen, listen, people can call me, well, you can call me a LeBron hater, you can call me all those things, I, I, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. This is what I do. I do sports. I do radio. I do color commentary. I freelance for different companies. This is what I do. So that stuff doesn't bother me. What's always funny to me, though, is how fast the narrative and how fast everything shifts when LeBron doesn't get what either he wants or his fans want. And everything shifts. And we'll get into that with Boogie Cousins and some of these other names that got uh, that got taken up really, really quick, too. Uh, quick break coming up right now. Jason Haley with Rock and Wrap Up. It's the Hollywood Rock and Wrap Up with your host, Jason Hadley. Kevin Spacey may have his underage sexual assault case thrown out after his accuser took the fifth during intense questioning. Accused of groping a then 16 year old boy while plying him with alcohol, clearly this is nobody's first time with the fifth. Activists from PETA sued the animal trainers for the movie A Dog's Way Home, citing the dogs were subject to abuses during production. Meanwhile, PETA can expect backlash of their own for riding their high horse to death. MTV announced the cast lineup for season three of the reality series X on the Beach. Imagine a Jersey Shore style show where they don't drive to the beach as much as they just wash up on it. Rock legend Eddie Money was forced to cancel tour dates, currently suffering from pneumonia. And at 70 years old is the only thing new on Eddie Money. And that's the Hollywood Rock and Wrap Up. Follow us on Twitter at Rock and Wrap Up. Rock and Wrap Up, my man Jason Headley. I love that guy. He's a stand up comedian that I do stand up comedy with out here. He started his Rock and Wrap Up, and I like to support my friends and support my colleagues. So we use him, one of our first sponsors here on the show. You listen to VJ's on Sports with Like Conduct Live on Spreaker.com. I'm your host, VJ Vernon Husky, aka VJ Ray. That's because I always think I am. Hashtag 8515. And you guys know because 85% of the things that I predict come out correct. And the last thing, big thing I think I predicted was that Kawhi would never be a Laker. I said Kawhi wasn't going to be a Laker last summer. And I said Kawhi wasn't going to be a Laker this summer. Now, I did not have the Clippers in play. I thought he would go back to Toronto. My prediction was that he would go back to Toronto, maybe on a shorter deal or on a one-year deal for 40 to $50 million. That's what I would have done. If I was Kawhi, I would have went back to Toronto on... A $50 million deal. I went to Toronto and said, listen, I'll run it back one year. Let's run this back. Let's see. Because I've been on record as saying the finals left me feeling empty. It really did. The celebration, the team that won, the way that things went down. You know, in my opinion, the Warriors were on their way to winning game six. They were on their way to winning game six. Clay blows the ACL. Game over. Series over. Finals over. 2018-19 NBA World Champions, Toronto Raptors. And congratulations to him. Congratulations to Kyle Lowry, who's a Philly kid. My dad's from Philly. Congratulations to Pascal Siakam, a guy like that. Congratulations to Danny Green, who's a Tar Heel, who I have family connections through, through the University of Carolina, through players that I know that have played there, friends and family. So it, it, it did leave an empty feeling, though. And you would think that there's a part of an athlete that say, you know what, we hear the noise. We want to run that back and show you guys that we are that damn good. But he decided to pull the moves that he pulled, reached out to Kevin Durant first. Kevin Durant was like, ah, I want to play with you, but I want to play over here. And Kawhi's like, ah, I want to play with you, but I want to play over here. So he's like, ah, well, I'm going to go play with this Uncle Drew guy. He's pretty cool. Like, okay, I'll call my plan B. My plan B is a homeboy. He's from Palmdale, opposite ends of L.A. County, and they're both outside of L.A. County. Palmdale and Riverside are both outside of L.A. County. It's not L.A. I mean, damn, Riverside is, what, over an hour? 
It takes over an hour to get from outside of L.A. to out the Riverside. Same thing with Palmdale. Depending upon the traffic, it could be an hour and a half, two hours. But I called my homeboy, who apparently, what it's looking like, wanted to be here last year. But decided, I'm going to take the money, and I'm going to stay where I am, and I'll just see what happens. That's the way that I took it. And ended up maneuvering a move to end up in L.A., and end up here with Kawhi. So that's where we stand right now. And with that being said, one of my favorite people to talk sports to from Spectrum Sports Network out here in Los Angeles, also from Luis Estrada Sports House on Blog Talk Radio. He does a great sports talk show. He does a great wrestling show. He is a great husband. He is a great father. He is a great friend and a man. And he is my favorite native, Mexicana in Los Angeles. I love this guy. And I'm very interested to see how he feels about his beloved Lakers getting LeBron. Like, they have LeBron, but they got LeBron. My man, Luis Estrada. What's going on, player? Man, I don't think I could ever live up to an intro like that, man. Much appreciated about it. It's a great. It's a, it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day out here uh, so far, man. It's, I can't it's complain, gorgeous. Man. Isn't it? I wake up outside. There's no cloud coverage. It's nice and sunny, clear. Yes. Oh, I tell you what, I'm lucky to have a day off today. <laughs> yeah, well, I got I got a day off from the main gig, but I got a bunch of film yep. stuff, and I got a writing meeting and a production meeting, and I definitely wanted to get on wax today because you know me, Louise. I don't like to jump out there when things break. I'm not a breaking news guy. It's just not my style. I like to let things unfold. I like to let things kind of... Uh, Kind of, kind of, just peace out a little bit as far as um, as far as uh, big sports news because I'm a guy. I don't need to be first. I just like to get things right. So we yep. we fast forward from the last time you and I talked. I think I asked you next time. I think the last question we were on the show last time. The last question I asked you. I said the next time we talk, Kawhi will be playing where, and you said what? I said Toronto, and yeah. I, I thought for sure he was going back there. Look, we all know the narrative. We've heard in the past that he doesn't like the super teams. We've heard that he likes to compete, which is very rare, seemingly, in today's NBA. It just seems like these guys. And I, you, know, you were talking about the one and done. I kind of go back to AAU basketball, where these guys team up, these all-star teams, traveling all-star teams. They get to know each other. Like, oh, I kind of like playing with you. It makes it easier for me. And we've kind of seen that transition into the NBA. So we've always known Kawhi to kind of be against the grain and kind of do his own thing. Uh, you know, everyone was talking about the Lakers. That's all we heard when he wanted to get out of San Antonio. He wants to go to the Lakers. Then it was, oh, no, he wants to go to the Clippers. But nobody knew for sure. And then you started to hear he wanted a second star in L.A. And once all the stars in free agency kind of dried up and everybody was going everywhere, everyone said, yeah, the Clippers were kind of an afterthought. But now you're finding out new details here and there that people are reporting where this might have been a plan of his all along. We knew he didn't really like the, like I said, the super teams. And he didn't really want to go team up with the Lakers. He kind of likes things a little quiet, a little more subdued. And you couldn't have gotten a better situation if that's what he wanted to come back home, be, I don't want to say the second team in L.A., because that's what the Clippers have always been. They've always been the afterthought. They've always just been, oh, yeah, we have the Clippers, too. Well, now this puts the Clippers for the first time in the forefront, not just in L.A. as a true title contender, but in the NBA. And that's something the Clippers have never been uh, since they've been here in L.A. So I thought it was a, you call him the savior. I, I said the same thing you did. He saved the NBA this season. Now, the question is going to be, how are the Clippers as an organization going to deal with being uh, favorites for the first time in their franchise history? And that's and that's an interesting point that you bring up because this will be new territory. Now, I, I you know, I'm not a big Doc guy as far as X's and O's. Yeah. Is Doc a caring coach? Absolutely. Does he really care about his players and the family? And I hear all these great things about Doc, and, and that's fine. I just always question, though, when the game's on the line and you got to get the dry erase board and you got to do some X's and O's and draw some some swig, squiggly lines and some arrows, I, I just never saw him as that guy. So 
He, but he's won championships. He's been on that level. And he seems to coach better like a lot of guys do when he's got better players. And now he has better players. I don't think it's going to bother a guy like Patrick Beverly because Patrick Beverly is just so raw. And that guy is just a dog. I don't think yep. it's going to bother him. PG, we'll see. Uh, you know, some of, some of these other guys on the roster, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see with them being the front runners for right now. Cause I, I still think people still lean on the Lakers and just because they're the brand and the narrative and, and the media drive is I I'm a firm believer. People just want LeBron to win because it's going to fit the narrative better. So people are still going to say this is a better team, even though I see an old team, I see a slow team and I see a bad defensive team. That's just that's just me looking at it basketball wise. That's not any personal feelings or anything right. in it. So you're that's an interesting question. I'll ask you this though. When you look at the Clippers, is this really a rivalry? We now we have all oh, the rivalries lit now. Oh, this is a rivalry. Oh, this is you are born and bred here. You've never lived anywhere else. You tell some of the coolest stories of your dad taking you to Rams games when you were a kid, Laker game, all Dodger games, all that stuff. You have, are close to the temperature of this city, and I'm an East Coast uh, a guy living out here now. Is this really going to be a rivalry, or is this going to be media fabricated to for ratings and for TV draw? No, I, I think for the first time since the Clippers came to L.A., it's actually going to be a rivalry because you've never had it where – Look, let's be real. When you look at the series, the whole series since the Clippers came to L.A., it's been dominated by the Lakers. Yes, the last five, six years, the Clippers have kind of flipped the roles. The Lakers have kind of been rebuilding. They didn't really know seemingly what which direction they wanted to go. So the Clippers have had a chance to kind of uh, become that team here in L.A. But they, the funny thing, B.J., is when you look at the Clippers and what they've done, They put together a nice run the last five or six years. But when you listen to radio out here, what's the first thing you hear? You don't hear about the Clippers. You never, you didn't really hear about Lob City as much. You still, it was, what's wrong with the Lakers? How can we fix the Lakers? Who do we need to get with the Lakers? Uh, when are the Lakers going to be back? That's what the narrative has been here in LA. For the first time, I think you're going to have a legitimate rivalry on the court. Both of these teams are going to be really good. Okay, I like the depth on both teams. I like what the Lakers have put together uh, in their plan B. I like what the Clippers have. The Clippers, one of the thing I like about the Clippers, they're young. Their guys are hungry. You, you're bringing in Mo Hart that's from Portland. You've got uh, Montrez, uh, Montrez Harrell, who athletically he reminds me of DeAndre Jordan. That guy's a dog, man. Montrez yeah, that Harrell, guy that, guy, that guy's a hard player, man. He plays hard. Yeah. And, and here's, the, here's the thing. You know, I, you know me, I'm not a dark guy either. But one of the things I'll say about this Clipper team, I, saw, I got to see him in person a couple times last year. And the one thing I'll say for them is they have no fight or no quit in them. They don't stop fighting. Even when they're down, they could be down big. And the next thing you know, they're up 10. They don't, they have heart. They don't give up. And I think that has a lot to do with Doc. You know, regardless of what I feel or what you feel, he's got the reputation of being a player's coach. Players like to play for him. Yes. And that being said, when you bring over, you know, a Paul George, when you bring over a Kawhi Leonard, two big, one of the, for me, one of the biggest things, that really is going to define a coach's career is if you can get your stars to buy into what you're doing and to buy into your strategy. And we've never heard any issues of people buying into what Doc was doing. And if Kawhi and Paul George buy in right away, which I have no doubt that they're going to, this is going to be a very, very dangerous team, especially defensively on that perimeter with Beverly, Paul George, once he gets healthy, and Kawhi. BJ, in all my years watching basketball, I don't think I've seen a, a better front three perimeter defense potentially as this Clipper team could potentially have this year. No, nah, not potential. I think we can knock that. I think with no barring any major injuries and missing a bunch right. of a bunch of games, I think that is going to easily be the hardest team to try to bring the ball up against. That is going to be the hardest team to try to penetrate against. And then when you get past those guys, if you do, you got some dogs back there on the back on the back line. In the, uh, yep. in the front court that, that play hard, rebound well. They take a lot of good body fouls. They, they'll, they'll, they wear you down. And I love your point of that they don't have any quit. 
We've seen him come back from 28. We've seen him come back from 31. We've seen him come back from 25. I think those are just three games I can remember off the top of my head last year. And I think they do take that from Doc. I'm old enough to remember. You're old enough to remember when Doc played. Doc was that guy. Doc didn't quit. Doc didn't care whether he was going against Jordan when he was with the Knicks. Oh, when he was going against Bird and Isaiah and those guys when he was with the Hawks playing with Dominique and Kevin Willis and those guys back in the day. I think Doc has has in, inserted that in, into this team. Flip to the Lakers. What do you expect from L.A. this year? I'm looking at the roster. Rajon Rondo, Danny Green, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, JaVale McGee. They bring in Quan Cook. You bring in Boogie Cousins, Kyle Kuzma, Jared Dudley, and uh, Caldwell Pope. If you had to put a number on it, and you had to put a round in the playoffs on it. Right now, I know it's early. I don't like doing this stuff in July because so much changes. I mean, it's almost a year, you know, that, that we would be away from the Western Conference Finals or the Finals. But if you had to just throw it out there, what, what can you see? What do you expect from this Lakers team, win number total-wise, and as far as they go in the playoffs? If, if everybody gets healthy, if everybody stays healthy, I could easily see this team winning 50 to 60 games. And I could see them going anywhere from the second round to the NBA Finals. I think I'm very happy with this roster. The the one thing that I was really worried about <clears throat> was, okay, who was going to be left? You and I spoke uh, on Saturday, and I told you then that my plan B, if they didn't get Kawhi, was going to be Patrick Beverly, JaVale McGee, and Danny Green. Uh-huh. They, got two of those, they got two of those three. I was very happy with that. Then you bring in, uh, you know, late, I think it was Monday they signed uh, Avery Bradley, which I think is a huge signing. I absolutely love what Avery Bradley brings to that. Does he team. still have it, though? I mean, I saw that signing, too, and Avery Bradley at one point was a great shooter. In a, uh, well, not a great shooter. was a really good shooter, but it was a great defender. But I, I haven't heard from Avery Bradley in, what, two, three seasons. Is, Avery, is he going to be able to come in and kind of – pick right back up from the Avery Bradley that we kind of knew two, three seasons ago? He's going to have to. See, we, do, we talked about pressure with the, with the Clippers. There are some guys here on this Laker roster that are now going to feel the pressure of ex- expectations for the first time as well. A guy like Avery Bradley coming in. But what I like about this Laker team is when you look at, you know, you look at LeBron James, you look at Danny Green, you look at Rajon Rondo, even Jerry Dudley to a degree, You've got and JaVale McGee, and let's not forget about him. You have guys who have won championships. You have guys who have been to the show come playoff time and who have won and succeeded. That kind of experience is going to be huge come playoff time. And I'm already talking about playoff time because, yes, I expect this Laker team to absolutely 100% make it to the playoffs and make a deep run into the playoffs. I think they've got the cats there that can help kind of ease everything out and, and – keep this team on an even keel. Now, this is going to be, to me, one of the biggest um, opportunities to see LeBron James' leadership, if he truly has it or not. Because you're talking about a team that's bringing on, I believe, like seven or eight new guys. So you're going to have to develop chemistry. You're going to have to develop cohesion. You're going to have – LeBron, <clears throat> we saw last year – him taking plays off defensively. You remember the play where Kyle Kuzma had to actually push him at a shooter yeah. during a game <laughs> because he was just standing around. This is a team that if they're going to go far in the playoffs and go far in the regular season, he's going to have to step up and lead and play on both ends of the floor. This lollygagging that he did last year, the Pete fans were already kind of turning on him last year when they saw this. People were applauding Kyle Kuzma when he did this. It's not going to fly when you have a team – whose expectations is the NBA championship. So to me, LeBron's really got to step up his leadership and show if he truly is uh, a great leader or not. Because guess what? You're not only going to be compared to your own legacy. You're going to be compared to the Lakers' legacy. And now you've got a team down the hall that's you know just as good, if not better, than you are, that you're going to have to go prove that you're still the guy. So there's no room for error for this team. Barring injuries... They're going to have to play hard every single night. You're going to have to sit there and say, I have to put up forth my best effort. You might win a big blowout game and take a fourth quarter off or even a third quarter off. That's fine if it's a big blowout. But night in and night out, it's no longer you show up, I'm LeBron James, I can do what I want. No, 
you're going to have to lead and you're going to have to show it. It's different when you go to Cleveland or you go to Miami. Yes, there were expectations, but it wasn't L.A. When you go to L.A., when you go to New York, it's different. LeBron James found that out last year. We're going to see if he, if he continues to make that transition and if he continues to accept that this is a bigger spotlight and this is a Lakers community that demands more of their superstars than just numbers. We're not a numbers community. We want results. Now, you talk about every night playing hard, and that leads me right into the next topic, the, West of the, the rest of the Western Conference. I, I understand L.A. is the epic center of entertainment. I understand New York is an epic center of entertainment. And when the Knicks or the Yankees are good or the Rangers are good in hockey, and when you have USC football out here, UCLA basketball, Lakers, Kings hockey, Dodgers baseball, everybody kind of forgets that there's other competition, there's other teams. I look at Utah. I look at Denver. I look at Portland. I don't care what's going on in Houston. James Harden is still good enough to get 53, 54 wins by himself. Whether people like his style of play, and I'm not a James Harden style of play guy, but I'm also in the results. I'm also in the results based business. I'm I'm about results. Who won? What's the record? What's the seeding? Where do they sit? I don't care how they got there. Just show me where they are at the end of the year, and then we'll talk about all the subplots and all the uh, sublines and all the variables. The rest of the West, I feel like, is just getting so disrespected. Do you think that that kind of drives them to say, okay, you guys want to just think just because AD's there and LeBron and, and you know, they're the Lakers that we're just going to roll over and let, you know, there's already this, this myth, I think, and I think it's a myth, that the league doesn't want the Lakers to win. I think that's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. It's like, I think the league wants the Lakers to win. To say that they don't want them to win, like, why would you not – Want the Lakers to win? They're the, they're the Lakers. They're the, they're the epic center when they're good of the NBA. Uh, give me a team or two out there. Are are your thoughts on the rest of the rest of the West? Even the Spurs. I mean, I look at the Spurs and I'm like, are you guys forgetting that they still have Greg Popovich and that he was still working with some younger pieces? And the Spurs are always best when they have these quiet off seasons. They have these quiet off seasons. I know Duncan's not there. I know Tony Parker's not there. I get that. But they still got some dogs there, and they still got some all stars there. I'm not sure if I like what Morris is about the pull. I'm not. I don't know what that's about. I'm not sure why you would want to go to New York, and that that's kind of out there that he wants to. He might back out to go yep. play for the Knicks and instead of playing for the Spurs and playing for Popovich. I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but you know, hey, to each his own. But tell me about the rest of the West, and is this just a lockdown foregone? Because even even the Golden State Warriors, if you think that Steph. And, Dr- and Clay and Draymond and Looney and those guys. If, if you th- and, th- and they got D'Angelo. If you think those guys are just going to lay down and say, okay, well, we'll just take this year off because all eyes are on the Lakers and the Clippers and we're, we're just going to let them uh, battle it out. I think people are crazy. Your thoughts on the rest of the West? Oh, the West is strong. The, 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 the NBA is strong for the first time in a long time. But the West is still really, really good. You're absolutely right. Don't sleep on Golden State. Now, I'm not, I'm one of those guys, I'm not big on the D'Angelo signing. Maybe not for the same reasons other people are not. And I can get, I'll get to that in a second. Well, no, 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 but, go, go, go okay. there. I know, I like that. Go there now. Uh, okay. why, why, why are you not feeling that? Because here, here's the thing with the, with D'Angelo. Look, he had a nice year. It was a, it was a, an all-star. They got called a replacement all-star. Could great for him. But there's two things that kind of, a couple things that kind of bother me with this. One, people are blowing up that he was an all-star. Let's not forget he was in a contract year. How many guys do we see ball out on a contract year? Let's not forget his first year in, in Brooklyn was not a very good year. It was actually, uh, statistically, he was actually worse than uh, his second year with the Lakers. So it took, it would take some time to adjust, maybe. But a guy coming into a contract year, year usually has you know a tendency to ball out a little bit, and that's something that D'Angelo did over there. Also, with D'Angelo, what role is he going to fit in with this Golden State team? Now, we know that they're going to try to have him kind of replace Clay for the year since Clay's going to be injured and miss most of the year. The problem I have with that is, well, yes, D'Angelo can shoot the three, he can shoot the rock really well, and he can pass really well, right? He's not a spot-up shooter. That's what made Clay so good and worked so well with Steph. Steph can bring the ball up, and Steph can dish it, 
they can go back and forth, and boom, they, he can spot him and shoot. D'Angelo's not that guy. D'Angelo needs the ball in his hand to create his own shot. He needs to be able to feed other guys. He's not a spot-up shooter. And defensively, he's not a defensive player. So you're also losing that aspect of it from Clay as well. There's also if, the, if, I, if I could really quick, Durant yeah. wasn't seen as a defensive player either until he got there and Kerr said, listen, you got to have to play defense here. And then Durant well, turned into a guy that was like, what, second in the league in blocks. Right. And, and that's absolutely fair. That's absolutely fair. But with D'Angelo, I ha- we haven't seen that. At least with KD, he wasn't known as a defensive player, but we had seen flashes where he could play defense. You knew it was there. We haven't seen that with D'Lo yet. The other thing that makes me question D'Lo is a quote that was uh, attributed to him once he got once free agency was starting. There was a lot of chatter. You heard it. I heard it. That him and the Lakers had mutual interest. And the thing that kept coming out was, now that Magic is gone, he has interest. My question was, why is he still worried about what Magic is doing? Why isn't he just balling out? That was an issue we had before. Right after Magic was hired with the Lakers, he said, D'Angelo had an interview, and he said that the question was, do you feel like you have to prove yourself all over again uh, now that there's a new management? And he was like, yeah, it's kind of frustrating because I kind of felt like I was good. And it's like, wait a minute. Why are you feeling like you're good on a bad team and you're only 20 years old? You should be trying to prove yourself every single night, especially here in the NBA, as young as you are. So you're telling me now that at 23 you think you've proven yourself because you've made one all-star game, you've had one good year. No, you've got to show me over longevity. You've got to show me consistency. D'Angelo hasn't shown us yet <clears throat> that yet. And to, to sit there and be like, because Magic is gone, yeah, and maybe I'll consider it. That, to me, shows that he's still got some uh, maturity issues going on for me. He's only 23. He's got plenty of time to mature. But th- those, are, those are the kinds of things that make me question, can he handle pressure? Because if he's feeling pressure just because Magic is there, what's he going to feel when the expectations are a championship? Is he going to be able to deliver that? Don't tell me ice in my veins when you hit a game-winning three-pointer in a regular season game. That's a great accomplishment, but it's not the playoffs. you got to show me in the playoffs. The PG move kind of shocked everybody. No one saw it coming. Stories yep. came out that Kawhi Leonard has switched the Laker meeting multiple times. Um, yep. And you know what? Just on that really quick, I, I don't want to you know assume anything, but... I, I could just see Kawhi sitting in a limo or the backseat of an SUV. I think Kawhi is playing around, man. I don't think this was, you know, I don't think he was ever going to be a Laker. He's just like, I'm about to watch, watch what I do. I'm about to switch the meeting again. And the Lakers brothers, okay, yeah, yeah, Kawhi, we'll meet you over here. Oh, yeah, yeah okay, no, okay, you don't want to meet there. Yeah, 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 we'll, we'll meet you over here. You know, rightfully so, you're trying to get the guy. But something would have told me, like, hold on, man. What the hell is going on here? This 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 doesn't sound legit. This doesn't sound like the real deal. And it's because it comes out that he was trying to meet Paul George also, too. I think this story is taking a bad narrative because it's, oh, nobody wants to play with Russ. When another story came out, and, you know, a lot of these stories can be damage control, that Russ had asked for a trade quietly and asked for it to be kept quiet. I'm not sure if you saw this. Uh, I read it late last night that he had asked for a trade and he asked for it to be kept to be quiet. And that opened the door for PG to say, okay, well, if Russ wants out, then, you know, once it came to PG that Kawhi wanted him with the Clippers and they wanted to try to make this move happen, then PG was also there like, oh, okay, cool. Well, if Russ wants out, I want out too. It right. also yep. kind of has the, 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 the narrative of, and I'm going to go there, and I was on The Odd Couple on Chris Broussard and Rob Parker's show back in November, and if you saw my social media, I posted it about four or five days ago and told everybody they could go to, I think it's the 1558 mark when I started saying it and I started telling people and I asked them, if you're in your prime right now and you have a brand and you're a really good to great player, do you want to go play with LeBron? Not because LeBron's not a good player, but like Kevin Durant said, it's very toxic. There's a lot that comes with it. And if you do not win, you're going to be the blame game. And if you do win, 
People are going to forget you were even on the team, i.e. Kyrie, i.e. Dwayne Wade, i.e. Mm-hmm. Kevin Love, Chris Bosh. Just go down Just go down the list. And yep. uh, PG could have came last year, but there was no one with the Clippers last year. And he pretty much said no thank you to LeBron. Kawhi said no thank you to LeBron. But this year opens up a chance for him to come, and he's going to come with Kawhi. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm ready to go home now. Um PG's mind, I know it's probably hard to get in there a little bit, plus the side story, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, and I'm not trying to start stuff, but I had no idea that he was dating Doc's daughter, and everybody read the rest of the story, so I don't have to say any of that, but I had no idea, that's another whole (laughs) angle to play with there, like, hold on, you were dating his daughter, and what did you do, and what happened, and now you gotta go play for this guy, but the PG thing was kind of a shot, I mean, if there were anything that shocked everybody, it was the it was the PG thing. Speak on that with Paul George and his fit, and just you know maybe what his thinking was on this and what that also does to this whole Western Conference and and, and the Clippers. Well, I, I think that's what threw the shock. I don't think the shock was so much Kawhi going to the Clippers. You because when you think about the recruiting process, okay, one of the things that you kept hearing was Kawhi wanted absolute silence. Nobody, he didn't want anybody to talk. Who was the only team you didn't hear anything from? It was the Clippers. You, you saw the big hoopla in Toronto. You heard about the Magic Dinner. Oh, God, uh, Magic the, Job. Man, everywhere. Man, the, La- the Lakers were spilling all the beans. Right. So, like, you heard about that those two things. You didn't hear anything from the Clippers other than, oh, they're out. Oh, I think they're out. That's all you heard. And then you know, it kind of made sense because, again, you didn't – all the, the big-time free agents were gone already. So you thought, okay, nobody saw this Paul George thing coming. And anybody that sits there and tries to tell me after the fact, oh, yeah, I knew. Oh, yeah, I had heard about that. I'm, I've straight out told people they're lying to my face because there is no way you knew that and kept your mouth quiet. There's no way you said absolutely nothing if you knew. If you were a hundred percent sure, so to don't tell me after the fact. Oh yeah, I knew. No, you didn't hear an inkling of that when that trade went down. VJ, I was asleep. Okay, I had gone just gotten home from work. We had just had that seven point one earthquake. I was settling down my family, and I fell asleep on the couch. I te- I te- I text you. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it- I te- I text you back about one thirty in the morning because that's when I woke up. Yeah. It, and I woke up and I got, you know, you had texted me, a couple of other people had texted me. I'm reading all this news. I'm like, what the hell did I just miss? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm going back and I'm looking at all the stories. No joke, BJ. I think I was up until about four thirty, five o'clock that morning. And I had to get ready for work and I had to leave at 9 a.m. to go to work. So I'm sitting there. I'm reading all the stories. I'm trying to make sense of it all. And I'm thinking... Did we hear any rumblings about this? Was this even something that was thought of? No. And you're like, no. no. Nobody thought about that at all. Great. It, look, <clears throat> if Paul George wanted out after a, two years in OKC, I have no problem with it. You, we've talked about this one thing before, and I'll, I'll reiterate exactly what you just said. When it comes to t- partnering up and free agents coming to play with LeBron James, we have yet to see an impact free agent go go to LeBron James and team up with him. It hasn't happened, and people want to point to you know Chris Bosh. No, they went to Dwayne Wade and go to play. But yeah, go they play wouldn't with go play with Dwayne Wade. They can they can try right. that all they want. They could if they all went to Cleveland. Then hey, you got something. But they went right. to Miami to play. Dwayne didn't have to pack up any uh any any furniture and wrap any any dish. He didn't have to wrap up any dishes and and newspaper. They went to go play with Wade. Right, and then he goes back to uh, Cleveland. Kyrie's already there. They traded Andrew Wiggins for for Kevin Love. So it wasn't like Kevin Love, as a free agent, came over there. Now, he did re-up there for that five-year max. But then what happens as soon as he does that a year or two later? LeBron's gone. That entire team's blown up. And Kevin Love's there hand, you know, carrying the bags. So I kind of feel like he got a bad, bad deal there. But nobody, no free agent has really gone somewhere that's of like high priority star caliber free agent to anywhere where he's gone. That's just a fact. 
So if people want to spin it like, oh, well, he missed out because of this or that. No, he didn't miss out. If you look at his history, people don't want to go play with him. So it's not a new narrative. And people that are, that are saying it's a new narrative haven't been paying attention or have just been spinning it the other way for so long. And now it's like the, there is no more excuses. You're in L.A. You know, we got beautiful weather, you know, beautiful beaches, beautiful women everywhere. And, you know, so why, why can't you get guys to come to L.A.? Oh, wait, they want to go across the way. Why? You got Jerry West. You got Steve Ballmer. Man. You got Lawrence Fank. Man. Frank. You, you've got, uh, you know, you've got Doc. I was going to say a Kawhi. player's coach. Like you said, a player's coach in Doc Rivers. Right. You've got the stability. We both kind of joked around, DJ. Uh, we don't want to see him with the Clippers because it's the Clippers. Well, now he's done it. And it only takes one superstar to really sign and kind of change the direction of the franchise, even for just a little bit. And that's what's just happened with the, with the Clippers. This is their first mega free agent that they've ever gotten. And I'm not going to say it's the first mega trade they've ever made because they did trade for Dominique. He was a big name for a while, but he was at the end of his career. They had Chris Paul and DeAndre Jordan and um, Blake Griffin. They had the whole Lob City thing. That was fun and entertaining for a while, but it wasn't the big name. These are the two biggest names, in my opinion, in Clippers history. And that's through trade and draft. You're right. The Clippers have never landed a major free agent that's been out there on the market. They drafted Blake. They drafted DeAndre, and they traded for Chris Paul. This is the first time someone sat with them and said yes, and it's all to the logo. And I I tell you, man, I made the joke last week on my social media. My wife is not allowed to go sit around two men, okay? (laughs) There are two men my wife is not allowed to go sit. She cannot hang out with Pat Riley, and she cannot hang out with Jerry West. I don't care how old they are. I don't care where, I don't care if they're old and rich. I do not care. My wife is not allowed. My wife and my daughters stay away from Pat Riley and stay away from Jerry West. Damn it. Cause I don't know what's going on. I don't know what they're going to call and tell me in the morning. Dad, get married. Exactly. Get married to who? Your boyfriend? Nope. Get married to Pat. Excuse you? You get married to who? You moving where? You just do not sit in front of these two men and just say no. And now you look at what he's built. He built the Lakers dynasty in the 80s. He built the Lakers dynasty in the late 90s, early 2000s. He pulled off. He helped out the Lakers from another franchise with with Paul Gasol. And then he built the dynasty in Golden State. And then he comes back to L.A. He wanted to work for the Lakers. The the bus boy told him no, just like he told Phil Jackson no. If you remember, Phil Jackson was all set, ready to wake up on a Sunday morning and call the Lakers and said I'll come back. Yes, I'll take the deal. And we hear breaking news at like 1 o'clock in the morning that they signed Mike D'Antoni. Yep. And I'm not banging on D'Antoni, but you're telling Phil, you're, you're, you're offering Phil, and you're telling Phil no, and then you, because you want to be your own man, you want to bring in your own. Sometimes being your own man is very overrated in an American business. Sometimes you just need to do what daddy would have done or what mom would have done and just make the deal happen and just live with the success instead of trying to be your own guy and, and totally screwing everything up. But I, I agree with you with the Paul George thing. I, no one saw it coming. This was a total surprise. Uh, but Jerry West, man, this guy pulls it off again. I want to flip over to one last thing before we go to our next topic, uh, which I texted you about late last night and then earlier again this morning. I hope that the super team era is done. I'm not sure if this does it. I think it does it sort of. I don't think it does it completely. And this is, and I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I see a lot of Laker fans, especially a lot of LeBron fans. Okay, so now it's all even. It, it, it's all even. No more he has a stacked team. No more. And it's like, okay, now you guys are saying this for the narrative that if he wins, you could be able to say, and it wasn't a stacked team, and it wasn't a super team, because that's been the, you know, like, you know, rightfully so, that's been the knock on LeBron. But I wrote down some duels here, and it seems like the duels are kind of back, because we grew up in the era of duels. Mike and Scotty, Malone mm-hmm. and Stockton, Peyton and Kemp, uh, you had Bird and McHale, you had Zeke and Dumars, you had Magic and Cap, and then Magic and Worthy. Uh, you know, we, we, I mean, even Larry Johnson and Grandmama, we grew up on duos. We, it's okay for, I, I think everybody needs another star. I don't think you need four of them. 
I think you need right. two. And then you need a guy who's just going to get boards every night. He knows his job. He ain't worried about points. He'll take his five buckets a night. And then you need a few guys that are going to play D. And then you need a few guys that are going to come off the bench and they know they're only going to get 15 to 17 minutes a night, maybe 20 minutes a night. But they're going to come in and do their job. They know their role. They know their job. That's what made the Spurs so great. That's what makes the Patriots so great. That's what made the Yankees in the late 90s. In the early 2000s, so great. The Dodgers right now. You look at the Dodgers. I'm not a Dodger guy. But damn, if that team's not put together so damn well right now, they got rid of Puig, so you got rid of the Diva, and you just have these, you got you got two superstars, and then you just got everybody else that's, okay, I'm not hitting tonight, no problem. I'll sit here and spit out sunflower seeds and blow bubbles with my bubble gum and stick them on teammates' hats and joke around. Oh, you need me the next night? Okay, I'll go two for four tonight with two RBIs and, 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 and a big RBI in the eighth inning and win the game. That's how you win championships. But duels I wrote down. Stephen Clay, KD and Uncle Drew, The Claw, PG, even Giannis and Middleton, Dame and CJ. Uh, you got Simmons and B. Whether you like them or not, you still got Harden and CP3. Depends on what goes there. And, I mean, I even look at maybe a team like the Pelicans, and I, I'm almost ready to say Ball and Ingram. I have to watch them play together outside of the toxicity of the LeBron uh, umbrella. But I kind of like what they got going there. If you look to the Spurs, they got a duel there. You look to the Jazz, they got a duel there. You look to the Nuggets, they got a duel there. Like, are, are the duels back for good? And are super, is the super team era dead for good? Or am I kind of on to something with, ah, uh, sort of. Because next year, a team that loses can go, you know what? Let's just go get that third superstar. And people are going to say what they want to say anyway. Bump it. Let's just go do it again. I, I, hope, I hope the super team era is done. I didn't like the super team when, when it started happening. Now, you, if you're smart and you're able to build a super team with through your draft picks and maybe you add a guy here or there, I'm okay with that. But this idea of guys teaming up together and, you know, they go on these trips together and say, hey, let's, let's team up. Let, let's go here. Let's go there. I, I've, I'm done with that. I've been done with that. The reason I've been, I, like, when you go back, you can go back to when the Celtics assembled their team. Right when you had KG, you had uh, Paul Pierce, and then you had Ray Allen. Ray Allen was still really effective, but he was at the end of his career. But he was still what they needed. That was kind of like the birth of it, in the sense of yeah, we're going to try to put three guys together. Then you had the Lakers. You know, you had Kobe, you had Lamar. They brought in Powell. You had a young Andrew Bynum at the time, and people always sleep on Andrew Bynum of that time. I still maintain that if you go back and watch those teams. From like 2008, 2010, 2011, Andrew Bynum might have been the second best center, if not the best center in the NBA, and I firmly believe that at that time. I'll give you that, but do you call? Do you think that was a super team? No, not necessarily. But a lot of people want to say it. They'll say things like, "Oh, well, Kobe didn't win without Powell." You know, it wasn't until Powell got there that it started winning, and people forget Andrew Bynum already had that team with Kobe before Powell got there. When they made that Pau Gasol trade, they were already the number one seed at that time in the Western Conference. Sure were. They were taking everybody by surprise sure already. Sure were, yeah, they sure were. So then you added Pau, and everybody was like, oh, well, that's." it's almost like reminiscent to when the Lakers got Michael Thompson from San Antonio back in the 80s, and Larry Bird said, oh, well, just give him the championship. That's kind of what I felt the reaction was when they got Pau. They were already a good team. They were already making those strides, and then all of a sudden you brought in Pau Gasol, and you're like, whoa. And you realize you gave up Kwame Brown and the rights to a young guy that we didn't know much about at the time named Mark Gasol, who we all knew was uh, Pau's brother. So when they, if you want to call it a super team, you can. You don't have, you know, you, it doesn't really – I don't think it was a super team, but when you look at some of the names on paper, some people might say, yeah, that was a super team. Okay. Um, but then you had the thing in Miami where – that was the first time, and this is where people kind of still argue about, was it really a super team? No, it was a super team. It was a team up. It was the first of its kind. It wasn't the first super team, but what made it the first of its kind was it was the first time free agents got together and said, we're going here as a, as a group. We're going to team up. And it was the first time that you saw that. And it was, it was kind of like, huh. We can do this. And then you started to see the domino effect 
Well, it was like, well, who's going to compete with LeBron in this prime? Dwayne Wayne in his prime, and Chris Bosh in his prime. People always sleep on Chris Bosh like he was an afterthought. That guy was a was a double double machine up in Toronto before he got to Miami. Don't forget that. Yeah, he was, 20, he was that, twenty-two and eleven in Toronto. Right. People want to say, oh, he like he was just a throw-in. Man, Chris Bosh was a perennial all-star and one of the best power forwards in the league at that time. He wasn't just some scrub throw-in. And people want to put that narrative about him. It's like, no, man, you need to slow down and know who you're well, talking it helps, about. Because it, it, Le- it helps the LeBron narrative. That's why. Well, that, that's true. But at the, you know, the people want to rewrite history. I'm one of those guys. I'm going to tell you history the way that I saw it. And I'm going to give you as much fact as I can to back it up. And I can't stand. I like to call them fanboys. I won't talk with fanboys. Yeah, me neither. Because if, if you're going to sit there and say, this, look, I'm like, I'll put it to you this way. I'm not a LeBron guy. You know I'm not a LeBron guy. But am I going to sit here and say he's not one of the best players to ever play the game? No. Absolutely that not. Would be, yeah. That would be dumb of me to say. Yeah. So let, let's, you know, let's kind of be back in reality if I remember what Chris Bosh was. You know, then you had uh, the whole Chris Paul trade go down with the Lakers that everybody kind of said, oh, no, 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 this couldn't happen. We had Mark Cuban and Dan Gilbert allegedly, you know, talking to, um, you know, uh, David Stern saying, hey, you can't, you can't let that happen, blah, 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 blah. And that trade got rescinded. You know, and they, but then no one had a problem when, you know, we, we saw what was going on in Miami. Then you saw what was going on in Golden State. Then LeBron goes back to Cleveland, creates another super team. You know, so this idea that they've never been around is wrong because we've seen them. But they were all usually built through the draft and maybe a tr- one trade. When LeBron did it in Miami with the decision, that was the first time you really saw three agents kind of collectively decide, okay, this is where we're going to go. And I'm going to say this. One of the reasons I personally believe free agency has gotten to the peak as to where it is right now today, where we're following it day after day after day when it starts for the first week, is because of LeBron James and the decision. That show changed free agency the way we knew it, and it's we're seeing the effects of it now, where, where you see channels and, and stations going on four or five-hour shows just to cover free agency as it happens. Yeah, I'm with you, brother. Um, let's swap over to this last thing I want to go, because talking all these super teams and super players and all this great stuff got me to thinking, man. I watched an old video of mine uh, recently that I put up on my uh, Vest and Sports YouTube page. It's about five years old, and someone had asked me who I thought the top 20 NBA players of all time were. And I was like, wow, that's, I listened to that list and then I kind of went back and I said, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna revisit that. Uh, my list, my list hasn't changed much. And what I did is I broke it down, I broke it down into positions. I broke it down into positions. Uh, I have, let me see here. I have four shooting guards. I have four point guards. I got four small forts. I have four power forwards, and I have four centers. So I basically just went five times four is 20. That's the way I did it. That way I felt like it would be easy. You are the illustrious guest right now. I will let you pick our first position. And this is in no order because order is so hard to do. And all order is, order is just personal preference. I don't care about order. The only thing I care about is GOAT. I do care about GOAT. GOAT, Michael Jordan or Kareem, flip a coin. GOAT quarterback. Brady, Montana, flip a damn coin. Goat baseball player. There's, th- there's, there's. In my opinion, there's twelve guys you could talk about. You could say Babe. You could say Hank. You could say Bonds. You could say Griffey. You could say Mike Trout. That's fine. I'm gonna go with Griffey. I best five tool player I ever saw. I know he doesn't have the World Series ring, but World Series. A lot of it depends on your pitching, and you know, and if you don't have a, a great rotation and a great bullpen. You have no shot. I don't care what you're. I don't care how many runs you score. If you're losing thirteen to ten, you're not winning the World Series. So, uh, I think Goat Wayne Gretzky in hockey. I think that's the only one that most people will be solidified with. Goat in golf, Jack or Tiger, flip a coin. Goat in tennis, maybe there's three or four guys: Nadal, Federer, um, 
uh, maybe I, I, don't, I don't know if you throw Macaro in there. Agassi, Sampras. So there's four guys there on the women's side. You could go, uh, you know, Martina, Serena. So flip a coin there. NASCAR. You can go Petty. You can go Earnhardt. You can go Jimmy. You can go Jeff. So I mean, there's just so many. I don't, so go is you know whatever numbers are personal preference. So no no numbers. Just your 20 best players that you ever saw. In the history uh, that you read about, looked at, saw with your own eyes, whatever. So I'm gonna let you pick the first position first. So go ahead. And, who, who, where are you starting, buddy? Let, let, let's go right around the horn, man. Let's just start with the point guard, man. Okay. My, my top four point guards. This one was tough. Like they, they all were tough. Yeah. Th- th- this one was was really tough because you got guys that could be here, could be there. But I went with Magic, okay. AI, Oscar Robertson, and John Stockton. Those are my four. Magic, AI, Stockton, and oh, okay, wow. I only got two of those guys. And and okay. and the thing with and the thing with AI, AI's on the cusp. Like AI is right at twenty, but he could be twenty one because my my four points were Magic. No need to explain Zeke. That part of that's my Detroit Pistons heart. I'm a Pistons fan, been a Pistons fan all my life, but he was the first little man to lead his team yeah. in scoring and do what people said a point guard, a scoring little point guard couldn't do. Not only won a championship, he won two championships, and he is a, a staple in the minds of people's uh, memory forever because he was the leader of the bad boys. And I got Big O, and I got Steph. Steph is a guy that I didn't have when I did the video five years ago, self-explanatory. He had one in the MVPs. He had one in the championships. And at that time, Golden State was still brewing. They were still building Golden State. But Zeke, uh, AI is like, uh, I got him as like an honorable mention guy right on the outside. Because if you want a sub man for Steph or for Zeke, I wouldn't have a problem with it. He's just on my list. I think he's like 20 and a half. So he's just right outside. 20. So I know I'm kind of on the fence right there with that. But Steph, best shooter we've ever seen. I mean, he's got the two MVPs. He's a five-time All-Star. Uh, he led the league in steals before. He's a scoring champ back-to-back years. And listen, Kobe's a career 25-5-5. Steph is a career 25-5-5. 44% from the three, 90% plus from the free throw line. I mean, I, I think I think Steph is a real viable guy. I don't have Stockton, and I know some people may be like, uh, but I had Kenny Anderson on my show about three weeks ago, and Kenny Anderson, out of the top 10 point guards of all time, he didn't have Stockton on that list. And I was like, I kind of blew me away. I said, well, hold on, whoa, 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 you know I'm Stockton? He said, look, I know he led the league in assists a bunch of times. He's the leader in assists and the leader in steals. But, you know, to me, you when you got a Carl Malone, who could finish better and almost better than anybody in NBA history around the rim and had a great 15 foot jumper from both elbows, from both baselines, and from both medium wings? You better lead the, the league in assists. You better be the all time assist leader because you're just picking and rolling to that guy. And he's going to score or he's going to the free throw line to hit free throws. He was a sorry free throw shooter when he first came in the league and then Malone really stepped it up and became one of the better free throw shooters in his prime in the entire league. So, I I I, I kind of I kind of kept I I took that I took that advice from him and I moved Stockton outside of my top four point guard so Stockton doesn't make my list man. Well, I, I tell you the, the ones I had the, the the hardest time with on this list was Steph or Stockton. That's where I kept going. Back okay, and forth. so you got Steph right. So Steph is your twenty and a half guy. Well, here here's the only reason. Like I, I'm kind of old school where I want to see the careers finish. I want to see where they're going to end before I start putting them against guys whose careers are already done. Fair. You, you know? And, and like you said, Steph is arguably the greatest shooter we've ever seen. And when all said and done, he's going to be a top five, maybe a top three point guard of all time because he brought something different. The reason why I have AI in there is because without AI, we don't see Steph. And what I mean by that is, AI kind of changed the narrative of what the point guard was supposed to be. Up until that point, you kind of saw most point guards were distribution guys, guys that could play defense. If they could score, great, but it wasn't necessarily their biggest role. Their biggest role was to set other guys up to get assists, 
you know, to maybe score 15 to 20, you know, 20 on a given night. AI kind of changed that. He said, no, I might be undersized. I might be a point guard, but I can play D. I can score. I can shoot the three and I can distribute and I can go to the rack and dunk. So to me, he kind of changed the narrative. So you know, I don't think you get Steph's style without, without AI. And that's why I have AI up there as well. All right, and I agree with that. And listen, I've been on record as saying I think AI is the most underappreciated megastar, and that's because of the image. I, I I thought AI was the leader of the image of the league that David Stern wanted to really go away from, and AI was the poster boy for that. You have the dress code, and then you have the Slam magazine that comes out with AI on the cover, and he's got a button-down dress shirt on but no tie. The tie is loose. He's got a sports coat on but the shirt's untucked. And he's got a, a fedora on, but it's flipped up on one side with the tie around the back do-rag underneath with the title on it saying, I got your dress code right here. And we know exactly right. what that meant. And I think that's where AI gets knocked. But if you just go back and can remember or watch highlights of what a 5'10", 160, 65-pound point guard used to do in this league, 55, 53, 48, 40, I mean... Kobe calls him the toughest cover. He calls him and Tracy McGrady the toughest cover ever. I mean, the, yep. the guy was just uh, an animal. And and I honestly believe without all the side stuff and without all the image, the image, I don't want to call them issues, but with all the image discrepancies, we'll call them, I think AI would really, really make people's uh, top top 20 and, and maybe you know top 10 players of all time easily. Uh, so let's slide on. I'm going to pick the next one and... Uh, I, I'll pick an easy one. I'll pick an easy one. Small forward. Small forward Small to me, forward. LeBron, Bird, Barkley, Elgin. It was, That wasn't hard for me at all. Okay, I, I, I'll tell you what. That, that one was actually kind of tough for me because and I, I got five. Okay, I got okay. LeBron. I got Bird. I got Baylor. I got Dr. J. And I've got Scotty. Oh, my damn it. Five. I forgot Dr. J. I knew it. I knew it. Can I make a change? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can make a change. Okay, I got to scratch out Barkley. Am I bad? Yeah. I am so bugging. I got to. Sp- I'm scratching out Barkley, and I'm p- and I'm pinning in Doctor J. You're right. So mine would be Burr, Braun, uh, the Doc, and Elgin. Yeah, th- those are. I got five there, and, and you know when I lo- looked at this list, and I looked at these five guys, they all do everything really, really well, and they're. For the most part, they're all really tough. Larry Bird doesn't get enough credit for how tough of a guy he was when he played, man. That guy would go and scrap and just claw. On top of the fact the guy could shoot, the guy could pass. He wasn't the greatest defender in the world, but he made you work on the, on, if you were playing offense against him. So Larry Bird was just a tough dude. Scotty with his, his athleticism, his length of his arms, the way he could shoot the ball, he could pick and pop. He made you work on both ends. Elgin Baylor, who a lot of people have said Chick Hearn said was the greatest player he ever saw. And that says a lot because that Chick Hearn covered the NBA for 60 plus years. And for the, him to say Elgin Baylor was the greatest player he ever saw, that tells you something because Elgin Baylor was special. People forget about Elgin all the time. Dr. J is Dr. J. I mean, you don't get the dunk contest. You don't get, um, a lot of stuff that we see and enjoy now without Dr. J. And then LeBron, say what you will. A lot of people want to compare him to Mike. I kind of compare him more to Magic. Yeah. I think he's more in the Magic type, type player. And let's be real. He, the one thing about LeBron, no, he's not the greatest defender. He's a decent defender, or at least he was. But one of the things I liked about him, and we've had this discussion too, I always say what makes a great player great isn't the stats. It's not what all the different things that, that he can fill the stat, the stat board with. It, do you see uh, improvements in, in their game, and do they continue to improve? And LeBron James, I'll give him credit. When he came in the league, he was a slasher and a dunker and a passer. He was never a great shooter. He worked on, on that part of the game where now you at least have to respect him as a shooter, as a three-point threat, as something uh, someone out on the elbow. You keep evolving your game, and that's something that LeBron's done, and I'll give him credit for that. 
Not only that, he made some of the best damn commercials when he was with <laughs> Cleveland. I am, man, listen, I'm like you, man. I'm not a LeBron guy. I don't make apologies for it. I don't care if people call me a hater or anything. But I do recognize talent. He's easily one of the greatest uh, top 20 or top 10 players I've ever seen in my life. I can admit that. But I, I have a love, I think I have a love hate relationship with LeBron. It's, it's like you said, when he makes up his mind that he's just going to take over and be Kobe and Jordan esque, I kind of find myself kind of rooting for him a little bit. Like, yeah, go be that guy. But then when the passive aggressive stuff and some of the off the court cryptic messages and things of that nature come into play, I'm not really big on that stuff. So I kind of shy away from that type of stuff that he does. Um, but, man, those commercials where he played his uncle and he played the little kid and he played himself training in the pool. And even the puppet commercials with him and Kobe, even though it wasn't his voice, that was Keenan Thompson and David Allen Greer, uh, two really good actors. And David Allen Greer, one of my yep. favorite comedians of all time. But just, you know, even the commercials and uh, and some of the stuff that he's even acted in, it's very entertaining stuff. So I'm with you there with LeBron. Uh, Bird, like I said, self-explanatory. Bird can do it all. I will add in. Remember, Bird was a white guy who so-called couldn't run and couldn't jump. And the man just did whatever he wanted to do or whoever he wanted to do it with. I believe he won three straight MVPs, if I'm not mistaken. Is that is that correct? Two or three in a row? I I believe he won. I want to say two in a row and okay. three overall, but I'd have to double check. Well, I know he's got three overall, but I, I, I just I maybe it was three. I, I thought it was three in a row. I thought Bird just swept he, the MVP. Like, it, 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 he might have. I, I don't remember off the top of yeah. my head. And then Dr. J, like you said, we don't have the dunk contest. We don't have the high-flying, palm-the-ball kind of showtime stuff. Doc was the number one overall pick in the ABA and the NBA, so both leagues wanted him number one overall. He decided to go play with the Virginia Squires, my home state of Virginia, so I, I got to love for him there. And then with Elgin, it's not just Chick Hearn, man. If you sit with some of these OGs, my wife is from L.A., born and raised out in Inglewood, Hawthorne, Gardena area, Crenshaw, South Central. She got family all over that spot. And when you go to the cookouts, and you sit with some of the OGs playing bones and dominoes and spades, and you start talking basketball, they love Magic and Kobe. They do. They talk them guys up like they're God. But you talk to the old guy, he'll tell you. Elgin, he tell you, none of them were better than Elgin. And Elgin did it in the time where there was no three-point line. And this yep. year's Elgin average. People forget. This year, El- Elgin, he had three straight years where Elgin averaged uh, over 30 points. I want to say... Uh, off the top of my head, 1960 to 63, I think it was. He averaged 34, 38, and 34. So there was yeah. a time where Elgin was just, you know, unstoppable. And, and nobody and nobody could do it. And they were still playing 80, 82 games in that, at that point, too. People said, oh, well, they won a lot of teams in the league. Well, he played 80 games one of those years. He played 80, 78, I believe, another year. So what, they, they were playing somebody, and if you play a team enough, you should know how to stop them if you're playing them 10 times a right. year, and he's still hanging 38 on your dome piece. You know, that that's something to be said for that. All right, so we got point guards and small forwards out the way. It's on you, partner. Next next position. Let's go to the one I had the most fun with, and that's the center position. Ah, I love the Okay, center. okay. There, there are so many good ones. Like People want to put centers in different categories all the time. No, man, they're still basketball players, and they're good. I got five, and it starts with the cap, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you've got Shaq, you've got Wilt, you've got Bill Russell, and you've got Hakeem. Those are my five, and those guys, like, you know, you see the, the, the highlights from Wilt and Bill Russell going at each other, and it just looks like poetry in motion. Shaq was just a bruiser that was going to punish you every single time you got in his way. Hakeem, to me, he was, the for me, one of the... Um, uh, what's the word I want? Anchors, I guess you could say, or the starters for this thing that we have, the stretch fours and stretch fives. He was one of the first guys to kind of step out and shoot a 15-footer, 17-footer. You had a couple of centers that were going out shooting threes, like Jack Sigma and Manu Bull, but Hakeem was doing this on a consistent basis, and he was hitting them. Uh, so to me, he was kind of the start of the evolution of the stretch fours and stretch fives. And then you got Cap, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. People forget how dominant and how good this guy really was, especially in the 70s and early 80s. You know, they see, you know, you'll see the highlights or you'll see him at the end of his career and you're like, yeah, he was okay. No, he had a shot that was unstoppable, unguardable, 
and he was hitting it with consistency. Even in his last year, his 20th year in the NBA at 40 years old, was still hitting it on a consistent basis, and no one's been able to, to use that shot since. No one's done it better. Kareem was just, old, to me, it was one of the most complete basketball players we've ever had. All right, so run that five down to me again. Who you got? I got Kareem, uh-huh. Hakeem, Shaq, Wilt, and Bill Russell. Okay. All right. Uh, mine was mine was uh, a, a little different. I wanted to put the dream in there, but if I put the dream in there, then that takes out. Then that would have taken out Russell because I only wanted to do four centers because I went okay. four, 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 four. So I have Cat, I have Wilt, and I have Russell, and I have Shaq. Cat, self-explanatory, the hook shot, legendary player, record at UCLA, only lost one game, I believe, in his high school career. I mean, Cap, Cap, Cap's the man. If he was yeah. more, I, I believe that his stance on in social, uh, social injustice and aligning himself with Muhammad Ali and, and Malcolm X and those guys, rightfully so. Jim Brown and those guys, rightfully so. I'm not knocking him for that. He, that's where he should have stayed. But I think that cost him in the eyes of the good old boys network society in America that has cost him coaching jobs. That has cost him the ability to really be attached to the NBA. People remember him, but not like they really should. There should be an award named after him. He should have been a coach law. He should have been a coach 20 years ago somewhere if he really yep. wanted to coach. And I think he's bitter. I think he is. I think when you hear him talk, you can really hear it in his voice. You can see it in his body language. He still kind of looks at the league like, you know, or, or the media. I'll say not the league, but the media as, you know, like as you guys did this to me. You know, I could be I could be so much more part of this game and in today's era, and I'm not able to do so, and it's simply because of the stance I took. So I, I give him extra points for that. Will Will was just so dominant. You want to talk about dominance? I don't care who you're playing against. When you have a year when you average fifty and twenty five, I don't give a I don't give a damn if it's at the YMCA. That's just dominant. I mean, Will was also an All-American track star and high jumper at Kansas. Like, the man was just a freak of nature. So strong, so quick, so agile. And the, the battles with him and Russell were legendary. And then you have Russell. We didn't know what a real block shot or our offensive rebound was until Russell came along. And we truly don't know how many offensive rebounds he has because they didn't even keep offensive rebounds at a certain part of his career. They didn't even keep that stat. So we don't, it's almost like Deacon Jones with sacks. We don't really know how many sacks Deacon Jones really has because at one point they had to start keeping him the stat because he was getting so many of them. So we don't even know how many rebounds Russell has. And then Shaq, I I was on the edge with Shaq and Dream because Shaq was just a dominant move, everybody. I'm bigger and stronger force. Uh, But people have to remember what Akeem did to young Shaq. And I like young Shaq. I I tell people all the time, I'll take take Orlando Shaq over L.A. Shaq any day. And that's because L.A. Shaq almost just felt like a cheat code. He put on the weight, he put on the muscle, and he could just move people out of the way. He didn't have to really have really perfect footwork. He had a really good or decent drop step. And once he got his shoulder or his elbow around you, he could just move other grown men that were seven feet tall and 280 pounds out of the way and dunk the ball. So Shaq would really be on the cusp with Dream. It's like where you want to go, but... You know, I hate the fact that there's three Lakers there, but you know, it kind of is what it is. So, I had Cat, yeah. Will, Russell, and Shaq. So, uh, next one, my favorite one, shooting guard, MJ, the GOAT, if you want to put him or, or Kareem flip a coin. We know all the stats for MJ. We know what MJ did, six finals, six wins, six finals MVPs. When, when the money was on the line, when it meant the most, uh, not sure what type of teammate he was. I wasn't his teammate, but we hear a lot of little funny stories, and some people will say horror stories. Uh, ultimate competitor had to make stuff up in his mind. If he had to do that to get the job done, hey, it is what it is, and was just a killer. Uh, Michael 2.0, Kobe. Kobe was the same way. Kobe would just put his foot on your throat, and he just wanted to kill you, and he wanted to go at the best in the league. He wanted to... He wanted to be Jordan, and people will try to knock him for that. But I'm, you know, if I if I have a son and he wants to play basketball, I'm going to show him Jordan and Kobe tapes. 
You want to be a killer? I'm going to show you these two guys. You play baseball? You want to peer swing? You want to learn how to play the outfield? I'm going to show them Ken Griffey Jr. tapes. You are a boxer. You want to be a. You want to have just beautiful footwork and a great jab and just and, and float like a butterfly. Thing would it be? I'm gonna put on Ali tapes. If you want to just be a monster and an animal, I'm gonna put on Mike Tyson tapes. You want to be really, really skilled uh, with with the hand speed and the footwork? Then I'm gonna put on Sugar Ray Leonard tapes. It's it's just the way the game. It's just the way sports is. The way it goes. West the logo, self explanatory. Once again, was supposed to be this white guy who couldn't run, couldn't jump. Because, you, know, uh, you know, that's just the stigma when it comes to white guys, when it comes to basketball. But Wes did it as good as anybody else. Uh, his pump fake was legendary. Couldn't get pad. Got only one championship because he kept running into the Celtics so many times. One in seven in the finals, I believe it is. But then the man played yep. in eight of them. So. And then I snuck in Dwayne Wade there. Wade's career is over uh-huh. now. We saw what Wade was. I thought Wade took a major hit to his legacy when LeBron came to town. Rightfully, he stepped back after the first the debacle with the uh, Mavs and said, you take over. Don't worry about me. I got my ring already, you know, so let's just go get some more. You be the man. And then they went on and won two from there. Uh, but th- that was that was my four. And Wade was uh, super tough. I think he cut his career short by throwing his body around a lot. And this was still at a time where fouls were still real fouls. You think about it, Wade in his prime is when the malice at the palace happened. I think that really changed the way fouls were called in the NBA and the way games were officiated and the way contact and trash talking was kind of uh was kind of regulated in the league. I thought that night really changed the NBA into what we see it as today. And I think Wade still got enough of the times of tough NBA play. So I stuck Wade in there. So I had MJ, Kobe, Wes, and Wade. Okay, I, I'm down with that. I have three. I have MJ, I've got Kobe, and I've got the logo, Jerry West. Those are my three. And the reason why I only have three there, like I had Dwayne Wade on my list, I had Richie Miller on my list, and I had Clay Thompson all originally kind of in there. But when I started to look at guys, you know, going kind of narrowing it down to 20 and going by position, I had five small forwards and I had five centers, so I had to cut somewhere. Uh, Dwayne Wade would absolutely be right there with, uh, kind of well with in the same boat with Steph Curry for me. Um, but I, I'm right there with you with Jordan, Kobe, and and the logo. I don't think you get any any better when you start talking about shooting guards in the history of, the, of this league. I think that was the easiest one. I think shooting guards yeah. are always yeah. It's, it's, it's the easiest one because if even if you had a fifth, let's just go step. If you had a fifth honorable mention guy, who'd you throw in there? Because uh, remember, I, I, AI AI played the two also, so it kind of leaves no, a little but, room there. But who you got? I would either put uh, Joe Dumars or Reggie Miller in that spot. Okay. I like Joe. I yeah, like Joe. I'm not sure about Reggie, man. I just, the guy, I mean, honestly, the guy didn't average 20. He didn't. He no, didn't. He didn't. A lot of people don't. They get surprised when they hear that. The guy didn't average 20 points. I think we get caught up in the in the Knicks rivalry. I really do. I think we really mm-hmm. overrate Reggie's career because of the Knicks rivalry. You, you know what? You know what I liked about Reggie is that, no, he didn't average 20, but he could score in bunches really, really quickly. When he got hot, there was nobody better in, in that time that could shoot the ball. Joe Dumars, what I liked about him, yeah, he shot the ball really well. He could play the point as well. But, man, could that guy play defense, man? That guy could defend and could defend one-on-one. I really liked him. And I'll tell you, the other guy I really thought about putting on there, um, but his career was just too short for me. And not by his own, not his own fault, but Drazen Petrovic. You'll remember that. Oh name. man, yeah. What? I mean, Drazen was that, a. Oh I mean, my god, Drazen was a baller. Dude, that guy could shoot like nobody's business. Yeah, that that guy alone made the Nets the favorite in NBA Jam of that time. Yeah, because you're right because he with, could just shoot. He could just shoot, man. That guy could play. So. He's another guy that I thought about really hard on, on when you start talking about shooting guards because, man, that guy could just put, put the ball in the hoop like nobody's business. So I had some guys that were honorable mention when I looked at it, but when it came down to it, I, you know, Jordan, Jordan Kobe, and, and the logo, that w- it doesn't get any better for me. I got another name for you. What about my man from Lincoln High? He got game. It's the Jesus Shuttlesworth. Oh, absolutely. He, look, he's definitely in the conversation. 
definitely in the conversation. Yeah, because in his day, shoot. in his day, he would he would yam on you too. It wasn't just shooting. Ray Allen would come to the hole, and Ray Allen's got some highlights, man, where he was jamming on yep. when, when the league had centers. Not these six nine, six ten guys playing centers. Legit seven foot, two seventy five, two eighty guys, and Ray Allen would come through and just and just serve you a plate of yams. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's a guy I had honorable mention. All right, last. This was actually a harder one for me. Uh, a few names easy. Then I really had to think, and I threw an old. I wanted to make sure I paid homage to some older guys too. So power forward. I have the big. Power. I have the big fundamental. Yep. I have Dirk. Yep. I have the mailman. Yep. And I have the guy who made passing for big men popular and made it a necessity for big men to be able to outlet pass. And that's my man, Mr. Goggles, Moses Malone. So I had Duncan, oh. Malone, Moses, and I got to get one international guy. But when you talk about a seven-footer that can shoot the way he did, he pretty much was the one superstar who didn't really have a second superstar in their prime, beat a team that was a super team in the Heatles with LeBron, Wade, and Bosh, beat them four in a row and knocked them out in six after they went up uh, 2-0 in that series, I believe. And uh, I just think Dirk was something that we might not ever see again. You see these big guys want to shoot. I don't think anybody's got Dirk. Dirk. Dirk's even got small guys doing the leg kick now. Dirk's even with the fall away with the leg. Dirk's even got young guys working that move now. So Duncan, the most fundamentally sound big man I think I've ever seen. I think Kevin McHale would be right under him. Carl Malone, the best pick and roll guy and finisher I've ever seen. Moses Malone. Moses Malone was doing 20 and 20 before we even really knew what 20 and 20 was for a power four. So, Duncan, Malone, Moses, Dirk. Okay, I'm right there with you. I got, I got Duncan, I got Dirk, I got the mailman, and I got the big ticket, Kevin Garnett. I put him in there. Garnett was a special player, man. He was one of the things that, that I really liked about Garnett was just his energy, his dedication to both ends of the floor. Um, and, and also the other, one of the other reasons I put him up there is he was really the, the first guy in the modern era to go straight from high school and succeed. Yeah. That, that didn't happen very often. I think the last one to really do it was Moses Malone. So you didn't really see a lot of guys doing it at that time, uh, until he came out and he did it and he was successful. Because after that, you start to see a barrage of guys do it. That's when you saw Jermaine O'Neal do it. That's when you saw Kobe Bryant do it. Then you had other guys like Darius Miles and, uh, you know, all these guys coming straight out of high school. Yeah, doing it. Uh, it was and just it, an influ- it was an influx of guys at that point. Garnett did right. it in 95. And then 96, like you said, it was, it was Jermaine, it was Kobe, a few other guys. I would have to go back and look at the draft list again because that 96 draft is ridiculous. If you remember, that's the yep. Marcus Camby, that's Ray Allen, that's... Uh, that's Pedro Stojakovic. That's uh, Nash. Alan Nash, Allen Iverson. That that draft with that '96 draft was crazy. Oh, absolutely! And you don't get any of that. You don't get those guys coming out early without Kevin Garnett's success. You know, people say that was like the best thing that happened in the NBA at that time, and the worst thing at the same time, because people were going to start doing it more and more, and for going college, which people didn't think. And I, I agreed with them. Didn't think it was a good idea for them or the league. But it's because of his immediate su- success that people started doing it. And if you really think about it, outside of Garnett, you didn't really have a, a guy come straight from high school to, call, uh, to the NBA that had the immediate impact on a team that he did until LeBron got there. Don't forget, Kobe sat on the bench and was only playing maybe – 10 minutes a game at most his rookie year. Del Harris kept bringing him off the bench. Jermaine O'Neal, when he got drafted to Portland, he really didn't do much there in Portland. He didn't really take off until he got to Indiana a few years later. So there wasn't really that level of success that you saw with KG from a guy coming right out of high school, maybe until LeBron got here. Yeah, Dell Harris. Look, I'm a Kobe guy, so I'm always bad. Kobe. Dell Harris just didn't know oh. what the hell. Dell Harris just didn't know what the hell he was doing. Kobe averaged 15 <laughs> minutes that year, and then it jumped up to, uh, and then it jumped up to like 26 minutes a game, and then from there on, I mean, Kobe was playing 38, 40, 41 minutes. You know, 
you know, 38 minutes a game all the way to 2012, 2013. Yeah, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just say Dell Harris ain't know what the hell he was doing <laughs> to have Kobe on the damn bench for Eddie, for Eddie Jones at that time when. Obviously, everybody, I think his rookie year, he started six games. And even in 97, 98, I think, he, I think his second, he only started like one game. He started yeah, one he, game and averaged 15, I think it was like 15. Um, yeah, 15, I think, yeah, like 15 points a game. He shot like 43% from the field or something like that. But, yeah, I'm going to just say Dale Harris didn't know what the hell he was doing. Because when Phil showed up, Phil was like, uh, no. You're you're starting like you're 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 playing and you're starting all these games you're playing all these damn games and that's just what it's going to be and then you know and then you know so goes the the legend of of Kobe Bryant man look uh great having you on today man I really appreciate you I know you got an appointment I got another guest I got to bring on tell all my fans and the guests and the uh, listeners where they can find you brother well you can find me on Facebook.com at Lewis's Fort House. Or at uh, on Twitter at L E S T R A B A J R. Man, it was fun, man. We I, every time we get to do something a little bit together, it's uh, it's always a treat. We always have a good time, and I always look forward to it, man. So I appreciate you uh, having me on, man. It was fun. I appreciate you back, man. Have a good checkup at the doctor's office, man, and tell them no rubber gloves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? <laughs> hey, hey, at, at our age, at our age, they got you. Yeah, it's all good. I just, just, get, just bring me, just bring me a, a lady in the room. That's all I ask. Do not, do right. not, do not, do not send in Doctor Adam Slocum into into my into the room, please. I will get right. up. I will walk out. I'm telling you right, right now. It, it, Oh, no, I'm the same way, man. I'm, I'm walking out. Do not, do not bring in, do not bring in Doctor Finkelbaum into the office. I'm walking. If I turn around and see him, I'm walking out. Right, exactly. Have a blessed day, brother. We appreciate you. You too, man. I appreciate you. Much blessed. All right, man. Luis Estrada from Elise Sports House. Good stuff, right there, man. Good stuff. I love having that guy on. He's a great guest. And uh, as you can see, with the top twenty players. You can kind of sub anybody in there, certain positions. Uh, whether, like I said, whether you you wanted to be the point guard, I think AI is a really uh, popular name that could go in and out. I think Isaiah Thomas also, especially uh, Steph. Um, I try to break it up and make it even. I just don't want the narrative being that you have like seven or eight centers or. You know, seven or eight small forwards. So five positions. I took four from each position. And I figured that's a fun way to do it. That way it seems a little more fair. And every position gets its love. Every position gets to uh gets to have it say there. So and then on and then just to backtrack a little bit with the free agency stuff. Uh I'm with him. I'm really hoping that the super team era is done. I like the duels that we have now, but I still think that a lot of people are, especially I see people on social media, okay, so now it's all even. Now it's all even. And you're only saying that because you're a LeBron guy, and now if LeBron wins, it, take, it, it takes away the narrative of a super team. What also just lets me know that you knew it was a super air too. You knew it. You knew he was on loaded teams. You just didn't want to say it. And I always say, if you just let things just play out people show you their true colors fans show their true colors last year boogie cousins going to uh go to state and that was coming off an achilles that was legitimately coming off of an achilles and it was easily oh oh well you know that's 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 unfair oh, oh you could just throw the whole season away oh you could just hand the trophy to go to state but this year boogie's going to la i don't hear none of that I don't hear none of that. I will agree with certain fans that I hear say, oh, LeBron can't recruit, but now Kawhi can, and it's okay. No, what I think happens is that people don't like when people corner the market. And I think LeBron, for a while, has tried to corner the market for himself each and every year that he's played and had his power. And I think over time, people get tired of seeing that. And people want it to be a little more fair. You have a super team, but let the front office do it. And then you don't want these players and, you know, everybody wants to be, you could trade all these guys and then the next thing you know, it's bro this, bro that. And it just seems a little disingenuous. Like at the Summer League the other night, if I'm Patrick Beverly, if I'm Hart or Ball or Ingram or whoever else was there, I am not dapping up LeBron. I'm sorry. 
Patrick Beverly, you play with the Clippers. It was in LeBron's jock strap. Frustrate LeBron. Getting LeBron mad. Getting LeBron to get offensive fouls in the post. Trying to ball him over because he was getting in his head when they played last year. This, this is supposed to be a rivalry. If it's a rivalry, it's a rivalry all year long. I don't like you when we play. I don't like you at Summer League. I don't like you at the mall. I don't like you at Disney World. I don't like you at In-N-Out. I don't like you at Roscoe's. I don't like you. Period. I would have loved to have seen him and Ball just walk right past him. And especially Ball when he pretty much threw you under the bus and wanted you out and wanted you traded. Told your dad, keep keep my name or my kid's name or whatever out your mouth. I'm not shaking your hand, dog. That's just me. And I think it comes off a little disingenuous. I think he's quite I think he's quite the basketball con artist. You guys remember when Van Gundy accused Jordan of being a con artist? And I and I, I felt Van Gundy on that. You hang out with this guy in the offseason, you let your guard again down against him, you have all this fun. But then when you go up to play against him, you don't have that hard-nosed competitive attitude because you let your guard down and you've been hanging out with the guy. I really actually felt Van Gundy on that. I really did. And Jordan didn't like it at all because Jordan knew it was true. And then you hear these horror stories now about what type of teammate he was. So if he was that type of teammate, how, how do you think he was against his enemies? And I think LeBron has a little bit of that in him where... It's a lot of bro tweets and bro this and bro that, but that, but I don't want you here. And I'm going to alienate you guys. And I'm, Look at the picture from the Indiana game last year where LeBron's sitting all the way at the end of the bench. Now people say, oh, he's done this before. And he's, we knew what the temperature of this was. It was right after the trade deadline when everybody was offered up. And you don't make that deal without running it by LeBron. The deal didn't go through. And you expect these guys to have any faith in you? I'm wondering how Rondo coming back is going to work this year because Rondo has spoken out about how last year went. A lot of moving parts. A lot of moving narratives for the Lakers and for the Clippers. For everybody else in the Western Conference, too, I said, like I said earlier, you got Portland, you got the Spurs, you got the Nugs, you got the Jazz, the Pelicans. I'm not sure what they're going to be, but they got some star power there. They got some players that can actually really play the game of basketball and have a high basketball IQ there. And then I'm hoping duos are back. Stephen Clay, KD and Uncle Drew, Claw and PG, Bron Bron AD. Then you kind of sprinkle in the Cousins. You don't know what you're going to get from Cousins. You got Damon CJ, Simmons and MB, Harden CP3. I'm hoping that era is really back because it was fun. It was a little more even across the board. And it's going to come down to role players, coaching, and defense. Stars are going to be stars. Stars are going to get their numbers. Stars are going to do what they do. But it comes down to role players, coaching, and defense. Uh, take a quick break. I got another rock and wrap up with my man Jason Hadley coming up, and then we will bring on the voice of Cal Poly Sports, Mr. Chris Sylvester, and he wants to talk Butler, his Miami Heat, and him and I have a beef about my man Russ Westbrook. All that and more coming up. VJ's on Sports Like Conduct, Speaker.com. The Hollywood Rock and Wrap Up with your host, Jason Hadley. A spokesman for Bill Cosby says the disgraced comedian has sworn off of sugars and carbs in order to maintain his health behind bars. Thankfully, it's just bread, not overwhelming feelings of guilt that are weighing Cosby down. Music legend Stevie Wonder announced he'll be undergoing a kidney transplant, assuring fans his donor is already lined up. Outside of a nightclub in Thailand, about to make the mistake of leaving their drink unattended. Kevin Hart celebrated his 40th birthday and starred in so many movies. The party security camera footage is planned for a Labor Day weekend release. An African-American actress cast as Ariel in the upcoming live action The Little Mermaid has racist Twitter up in arms. Coincidentally, also up in arms is their Middle Eastern Jesus that's been portrayed as a white guy since 300 AD. And that's the Hollywood Rock and Wrap Up. Follow us on Twitter at Rock and Wrap Up. My man Jason Haley with the Rock and Wrap Up. I'm sorry, that's the. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That thing's got me coughing, man. That's funny, funny stuff. And like I said, I love to support my friends whenever I can. So we are reaching out. Oh, excuse me. I apologize for that, guys. I'm sorry. I did not know that I was going to laugh that hard. 
I'm um, reaching out to my man, Chris Sylvester. So we're going to try to get Chris Sylvester on. I think I got him on um, right now, but nope, I don't. So I'm not sure if he's in a bad area. I always tell my guests, make sure you're in a good and make sure you're in a good area. I don't want to drop and lose calls. I don't want to call you and get you ready for the show. And then we can't get you on. But to uh, bring up the speed where I want to go next about West, uh, Russ Westbrook, we all know PG got traded. There's a story now that Russ came out and said that he wanted to be uh, traded secretly, but he didn't want the news out. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want it out there like that. And I suppose that made PG say, okay, I want out of town now too. And I think that Russ gets a bad rap uh, for his style of play, which I'm not understanding why that is. I said it before. If that was LeBron James or if that was Kevin Durant averaging a triple-double the way he does, and he's done it three straight years now, not only did he do it one year, he came back and he got it done another year, and then he came back and then he averaged a triple-double again and then did it again. If that was LeBron or KD, we'd be praising it like it was the best thing we've ever seen. If it was LeBron, we would definitely be calling him the GOAT even more. I think Russ has a standoff personality, and I think that that plays into a lot of things, especially with the media. I think the media could control such narratives uh, when it comes to things like that, which I'm not a fan of. But I do get and I do understand. So this narrative that people don't want to play with him, I'm not sure what that's about. Even with Kevin Durant, I thought Kevin Durant, more than not wanting to play with Russ, got tired of not getting his props as far as being the best player in the league or one of the best players in the league. And that's why he went to Golden State because Kevin Durant, and I'll, I'll defend Durant, but I got to kind of bang on him just a little bit. It's almost like he went there just to get his rings and now he's out. So he basically really did pull uh, uh, a, a LeBron because LeBron got out of Cleveland to go to Miami just to get some rings, just to quiet the noise. And then, okay, well, now I'm going to go back to Cleveland now that I got my rings and I quiet the noise a little bit. And if I can get one here, then I can go on my own TV show and call myself the GOAT. And now it's just it's just full-blown and full-on. Now my fan base and, and everybody else in the media that love me, they're going to de- they're gonna defend me forever, and there's nothing nobody can say or do about it. And I will also say this. I do want to address before I move on with my guests. I think I do got Chris Sylvester online now. We got him connected up. Is that this thing of people calling us haters because we're not LeBron fans. I'm, I'm going to put it out there like this. I, I don't hate LeBron. I'm not a hater of LeBron. What I don't like is the unhealthy cult man fanboy culture that has been created, that he's helped create, and that he doesn't diffuse. LeBron can easily come out and say, look, man, Mike is Mike, and Kobe is Kobe, and I'm me. And we're all different, and from different eras. He could easily take the high road. Jordan did it. Kobe did it. Magic did it, but the man went on his own show and said, I think that serious win made me to go. And that's fine if you want to say you're the bet Tyson said it, but then we know Tyson was selling tickets for fights because he also comes back later in his career and he goes, Ali's the greatest. Like, I get selling tickets, I get selling merchandise and media, but there is a certain ego that I do that I do think LeBron carries with him. You call yourself the king and the chosen one and all this other stuff. And I, I think there's a certain thing about that that people don't like. And I think that's with any sport. It was like that with Barry Bonds. Um, it's, it was like that in the NFL. It was like that with Allen Iverson. It's, it's been, it's like that with certain players. I think you're smarter as a player if you diffuse that stuff and say, look, this is a different time. This is a different era. So let's not go there. Don't put me in that cat. Like, you know, let's, let's, I'm going to let my career speak for itself. But he's also had post press conferences after the finals, and somebody said you're down three one or three zero three one. What makes you think? What gives you the confidence? Oh, because I'm the best player on the planet. He didn't say nothing about his team. He didn't say nothing about the role players or the coaches staff. He said I, I. It's a lot of I and me's. It's like it's like sometimes I feel like I'm watching a warm up from about for an opera. Me 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 me. That's what I feel like I'm watching. And I think that's where fans kind of fall out with them is where it's like, okay, so is it really about these other guys? It's just like AD. You did get AD here. But is it about you or do you? Or is it about AD? 
You want to win more chips in your team. And when I leave, you guys are going to take over. Take over what? The franchise, the front office is a mess. The front office is a mess. Like, there were actually stories where people said that they were telling AD, hey, go back to New Orleans and kind of pitch a fit. Why would you even, like, give that type of advice to another man to control their mindset? I'm just speaking real. I'm not, I'm not trying to bang on anybody. I'm not trying to point anything out that people don't see already. And I think that's what people don't like. I don't think people hate on LeBron. I think it's the unhealthy kind of man fan kind of groupy cult following that he has because you can't even talk to a LeBron fan because there's never there's never an admission to anything. To anything. It's like, oh, look at his numbers. His numbers were great last year. Well, if you're not playing defense and you can just reserve yourself and you could guys could go get bucket. We saw James Harden average 36 last last year, guys. These guys can roll out of the bed with the way the game is called, with the way the freedom is allowed for the offensive players. It's almost like quarterbacks in football. I don't want to hear about 5,000 passing yards from Drew Brees. Dan Marino was doing it in 1984 and throwing 48 touchdown passes when you can grab receivers past 10 yards, 5 yards down the field. You can take any shot you wanted at a quarterback. You can do a lot of different things to a lot of different players. So, uh, we had Chris Sylvester online, but we just lost him again. So, uh, but back to Russ Westbrook, I think that this narrative that people don't want to play with him is wrong. I really do. I think I think he is a great player, and what he's doing is legendary. Is legendary stuff. He's doing stuff that legends do. I'm gonna try to get Chris Sylvester back on the line here. I'm not sure if he hung up because he's impatient. I'm not sure what's going on. So let's see if we got. The voice of Cal Poly Sports. Chris Sylvester, you there? Four, two, seven, nope, that's four, the uh, seven, voicemail that we have for him right here. Let's see if we got him right here. We got him. Chris Sylvester, are you there? I got to get rid of Boost Mobile. Yeah, you got to get rid of Boost Mobile. I told you about getting the cell phones where you got to send in the cereal box tops and you get the free cell phone if you send in 10 cereal box tops. I warned you about that. <laughs> How you doing, hey, buddy? How you doing? Do I got you? You there, Chris? All right, we can't afford to lose another call. We might have to bring you in another show. You're either in a bad area because you're going in and out really bad, and it's already dropped twice. I really wanted to get your opinion, and I really wanted to debate it this PG and, and Russ Westbrook thing with you because I think you're really way off base. Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you. I can hear you now. I can hear you now. If okay. you start to fade in and out, if we lose you, man, we might just have to do this another time. That, that's all good. I'm uh, I'm I'm weaving through the mountains right now. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. So we'll try to we'll try to keep you as long as we can. You're a big Miami Heat fan. You guys did sign Jimmy Butler. First of all, let me make sure I gave you the rightful introduction I gave everybody else. He is the voice of Cal Poly Sports. He does traffic updates for iHeartRadio. He actually is also one of the main heads on Prep Sports Nation for high school football for the CIF Southern Sectional Divisions 1 through 10 all the way out here in Los Angeles. Gave me a shot on many all multiple outlets to be his color guys. He does play-by-play for ESPN, baseball, basketball, football. We just worked the Western Regional for the Junior NBA Global Tournament out in Ladera Ranch, California together for 11 sports. And I got a chance to uh, report and do some things out there for Vesta Sports Network. A uh, very good friend, a colleague of mine in the business, Mr. Chris Sylvester. Is that good? I, I think that's uh, it's more than good. <laughs> well, I, I pride myself on my introductions because I want my fans to know that these just aren't some Johnny Come Lately guys I bring on my show. These are guys that are really doing their thing in this industry, and I want to make sure that they get their proper props. So, on to the Miami Heat. You're a big Miami Heat fan. We've talked about the free agency stuff already. We know about Kawhi and the Lakers. I'm done with that. Football starts soon. I'm getting into football move. This is going to be the last free agency stuff that I talk before I get revved up for college, high school, and NFL season. You're a big Miami Heat fan. I always say once you sit down in front of Pat Riley, you're not walking away. When I saw Jimmy Butler take that meeting on Twitter that he's taking a meeting, I immediately tweeted out, and I think you saw this, he's not leaving Miami. That's going to be a done deal. But you have a problem with Russ Westbrook and PG, man. 
And I think you're all basis on this. He doesn't want to play with him. I read your response to me. Then why did he want out? There's a story that Russ asked out first about two weeks ago and asked that it be kept under the blanket. And they went to PG and said, look, Russ kind of wants out. So we're going to see what we can do to get you to L.A. on this Clippers deal to play with Kawhi Leonard. Your rebuttal on that, sir. Well, I, I, first of all, I, I, I haven't, I haven't seen that report, and I don't, I don't know if that report's all that, all that popular uh, or, or accurate. But from from what I've heard and from what what I've gathered from from the information that I've read, and obviously uh, there are folks that know uh, a little more than, than than we do right now. Of course, not not everything has has leaked out all the way, but it, it, it just it, to me the timing was was odd. I, I understand that that Sam Presti, OKC's general manager, he had a lot of trouble uh, surrounding surrounding Russ and, and PG with, with pieces to, to really compete uh, out west. Uh, I think uh, adding Dennis Schroeder, uh, you know, what was, was something they relied upon heavily, and, and that didn't wind up being uh, necessarily a move to, to take them to that next level. I mean, uh, look back at it. We, we, got, we got Russ and PG... Uh, essentially healthy for, for two full seasons, and they couldn't get out of the first round in the Western Conference. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the whole, the whole notion that the PG, a little less than a year after essentially committing himself to the OKC franchise for the foreseeable future and, and being, you know, a, a co-superhero, co-superstar with Russ Westbrook, it, it just kind of, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way because he, he, didn't, he didn't even take a meeting with either of the L.A. teams last summer. At midnight on July 1st, he, he re-upped with Oklahoma City. He was at a party in OKC with Russ Westbrook and said, OKC, I'm all in. And I'm curious as, as to what really changed uh, in a year's time. I think uh, Hawaii, you know, this is just my take on it. Uh, there's other reports out there that may, may choose this, but you know, a guy like Kawhi Leonard, you know, who, who knows Paul George from back in their high school days. Both of them are, are, are SoCal, SoCal guys. Uh, you know, I, I think Kawhi Leonard, that his, his team is, is trying to stay tight lipped and trying to make this decision. Uh, you know, from, from what I read from, from the top insiders that I trust, it was, it was Kawhi going to Toronto and going to the Clippers and saying, hey, I, I want to team up with Paul George. And it was Paul George going to OKC saying, I want out, and uh, it, now it looks like uh, OKC is going to go full rebuild. I don't blame them for doing this. I, I, I they, they were stuck with the salary cap, and and they were one of the teams that, that suffered from the hard cap and, and getting a sign and trade done. Uh, you know, they, they really couldn't afford to add many pieces. I mean, you, you put you put Russ and, and CP out there for another season with OKC next year. What's their ceiling? Second round, maybe in the West. Maybe the second round. I mean, what's going to happen if, if, you know, three years of Russ and PG, it's three first round exits. I, I, I think, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I don't think this is a bad thing for, for anybody. I think it's great for Paul George. I think it's great for Oklahoma City. My, my issue is, and, and, and this is tough to tell, BJ, because it is, what, what's today's date? July 10th? Yeah, it's July 10th. If, if, if Westbrook, was on the trade block on July 1st, would there be more than three or four shooters after him? It's really tough for NBA teams with the salary cap to say, hey, let me take on four years, $170 million of that contract 10 days after my roster set. Miami, they have some contracts they can move to make it happen. The Knicks haven't necessarily uh, you know, followed through with all of their free agent deals. We saw they were reworking the Reggie Bullock deal. The Randall deal is not official yet. A couple of other guys that they signed it haven't hit the pen to paper just yet. And then obviously your, your beloved Detroit Pistons, uh, you know, they have salaries that they could maybe make that work, but they're point guard heavy as it is. So, uh, you know, the, the market for Russ Westbrook is so small, and that's concerning to me. I mean, can you can you find me? And, and I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a fan of Russ Westbrook's game. I don't have a problem with Russ Westbrook, but what I do have a problem with is KD bailing and Paul George bailing. And you bring you bring Russ, who's a hothead himself and who's uh, you know very full of himself in a, in a good way. I think that that goes a couple of ways. It's a double edged sword. 
and you pair him with a guy who's very similar personality wise to Jimmy Butler, I don't know, you know, how that's going to work. I mean, if, if there's an organization that can make it work, it would be Miami with Pat Riley with Eric Bolster. They've done it before. They've, they've, they've been able to pair big egos before and been able to make it work. I mean, I'm not even talking about big three. I've talked about back to the Hardaway days. Back to the Shaquille O'Neal coming and teaming up with D Wade to win the finals in 2006 days. So uh, my, my issue with the whole Westbrook thing, maybe maybe it was Russ that, that went to OKC a couple weeks ago and said, "Hey, let's break this thing up." I don't I don't see us going any further than the first or second round with with all of the salaries that we're stuck with. That being said, uh, it's concerning to me that the market is is, is so small, or at least it's that way right now. Do we know if the market's small because a lot of these teams are kind of frozen? A lot of these teams are kind of stuck with contracts that they can't get out of and that they can't move? Maybe, but the, the issue for me is, is that if Russ Westbrook, you know, a former MVP who year in and year out averages a triple-double, isn't coveted by more than four or five teams, to me that, that's a telling sign that uh, the NBA and, and NBA executives, what they really feel towards Russell Westbrook. Now, I'm going to back up. Great points. You have some good points there. But I'm going to I'm going to back up and I'm going to respond to all of it. Number 1, this this whole PG thing coming here last year. I've said it. I don't think you want to play with LeBron. I don't think stars today in their prime want to put their brand on the toxicity that circles around LeBron because they've seen what happened. Kyrie put the writing on the wall. I want out. I may not go win somewhere. Fine. You guys can say what you want to say. But for my peace of mind and for my brand, I want away from this guy. I don't want to play with him. I don't want to be. They can still do their little corny handshakes and all that stuff when they see each other. LeBron put on the, the video on IG singing to him last year. Uh, Kyrie went on first take and kind of really put it out there like, listen, I, I, just, I want it away. I want my own way. I don't have to check in with anybody. I don't have to check with anybody. I want to do my own thing. And I think PG, and I said it on The Odd Couple last October, November. I forget what day I was there, but it was right when the season was about to start. I had just started. I asked Chris and Rob face to face. If you're in your prime, do you want to go put your brand on the line? Because the NBA is about the brand now of the person, not even the team anymore. It's the brand of the player. And I think last year, people can say, oh, he could have came to the league. The Clippers, the Clippers were, were going to be trash last year. They were supposed to tank. And, 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 and Doc Rivers does this great job, gets him into the playoffs, steals two games, coming back from 31 down in one of those games in the playoffs, steals game two at Golden State. And now you have, this this or this era now that they just created with PG and with Kawhi and resigning Patrick Beverly. So I think that he did want to come home. But his option was come play with nobody at the Clippers or go play and deal with toxicity with LeBron or just stay in Oklahoma City and get this money right now. And then, you know, we'll see what happens next year, year after next. But I, I, this, this this idea, yeah, and we lost them again. Okay, we're gonna have to do we're gonna have to do them again later. Yeah, we I can't keep dropping calls on the show. Sorry, buddy, I love you, you know that man, but we can't keep dropping calls on on the show. So we'll get Chris Sylvester in. But my my point, I'll finish up uh, before we wrap up here is that if if you're gonna use that as a barometer of hey, uh, you know he he, he could have came to L A last year. L A for what though? Could play with LeBron in the Tox City. Could play with the Clippers with nobody. He had the ability to come back this year. And I don't think that it's about the uniform anymore. It's about the brand of the player. And I, I couldn't, and before this was made, I couldn't see anybody putting on a Clipper uniform that's a major star at their choice. Trade-wise, yes. But to do it just as, as their choice, I just, I couldn't see it. And I still couldn't see it until it was actually done. And now that it's been done, now my opinion and my mind will change. I react to new information. That's just how I am. Something new happens, you give me new reaction, or you give me new information, I'll react differently to it. If it's the same thing and we're going to keep it the same thing, then hey, then I'm going to I'm going to keep my opinion and keep my thoughts about it. But then to move on to Russ and talk about these other teams and the money, I don't think that there's only 3 or 4 suitors. I think that there's 20 teams in the league that would love to have Russ. But you have to take on four years left, $171 million. And you have to be able to make it work within the cap if you don't want to pay the luxury tax. That's not easy to do. And there are a lot of teams that aren't willing to do it. 
and you're going to bring Russ in, it has to be ready to be able to get you to the second round or conference finals or you feel like you can win a championship. So you have the Knicks. That's not a championship team. You have Miami. I'm not sure about the, the toxicity and the, the combustible environment of him and Jimmy Butler. I do think that's real. But I do think that Riley Spolscher can handle that. As my man Chris Sylvester just said a minute ago before we dropped him on the, before he dropped the call, that we can do it, that they've done it before. And then you have my Pistons. I would love to see my Pistons get them. But then I'm not a big Blake fan. I've never been a big Blake fan. And I've wanted the Pistons to move. I didn't want them to make that move. Van Gundy made that move trying to seal, trying to uh, save his job. And they were going to fire Van Gundy anyway. That was going nowhere. So I hated the fact that he strapped our, our salary cap. And he put us in such a bad, put us in such a bad predicament that we, you know, it would be hard to do. Now, Chris brought up the fact that they're point guard heavy. Yeah, they're point guard heavy. So you move on to their point guards. E. Smith's already gone. He's with the Wizards. I never liked Reggie Jackson. I don't think you can win with Reggie Jackson. I think he's a guard, a point guard that's, you know, about his scoring. He's not about getting his teammates involved. We know Russ is bringing a triple double, but you're bringing a triple double and you're putting Russ with Blake. And with Drummond, and you might have to move Drummond. Or you might have to move Blake. Could you imagine Russ? I would say, I would say trade Blake. I would say trade Blake, give, give up a first round draft pick, move Blake, and move Reggie Jackson for Russ. And take that money on. Blake's got a big contract. You basically are just swapping the contracts and you throw Blake in and you throw uh, uh Reggie in there to make the money work. Maybe a, a protected first round draft pick. That deal can be made for Detroit. And you put Russ with a guy like uh with a guy like Drummond, and then you have all the young pieces that you're putting in there. The young kid that they just drafted, 18 year old, so you know you got a future. You got somebody the mold that they're calling in a Pascal Siakam kind of mold. I don't like really big time comparisons, but hey, you know, that's what the experts say, and that's what the experts that watch them overseas say. That works for Detroit, if you ask me. And you bring a hard-nosed, intense guy like that into a city of Detroit and that new arena that they just built that they can't fill up because the team's not that good, and you bring in a Russ and you team him up with Drummond? My God, you kidding me? That works. I would love to see Russ there. You got D. Rose coming off the bench. You got a veteran like D. Rose, uh, a former MVP. Wasn't a big free agent splash story, but a veteran guy who's going to be great for the locker room, who, who who Russ will look at and respect. And at times you can play them two together on the floor. I mean, come on. You got Kennard, who's a great three-point shooter. I mean, come on. You got some pieces there. And you got Dwayne Casey, who can flat out coach. I think he's a guy who can get the best out of Russ. So I'm just not, I'm not buying this narrative that nobody wants to play with Russ Westbrook. I think little shot just shut that whole franchise down. And let's, let's keep it real. That's a shot over PG where PG doesn't even say, you know, props to him. He just said, that's a bad shot. I didn't even like that response. Hey, just give him props to say, you know, good shot, man. You know, you know, some, some go in, some don't. That one went in. What are you going to do? I'm right there up on him. God just hit a, hit a great shot. But to say bad shot, well, that bad shot just wrecked that franchise. Wrecked that franchise. Damian Lillard just took down OKC by himself pretty much. So I don't like the narrative that nobody wants to play with Russ. I don't buy that. I think that that's just uh, an overblown. I don't think he's media darling. And when you're not a media darling, then these stories can come out and kind of be misconstrued it as uh you know they don't want to play with him or he's that kind of guy that kind of guy what he's doing is legendary stuff man and if you go if you're detroit if you're detroit listening to my show please hear me make that happen blake's not the guy blake griffin's not ever gonna be the guy but you put russ with drummond drummond has very low ego you're not worried about Drummond getting in trouble or Russ getting in trouble. And you put some pieces. We're in the era of the duos now. You can really do some damage in the Eastern Conference. That's a fourth or third seed team right there. We don't know how things are going to work out with Boston. We don't know how things are going to work out now that Toronto has lost Kawhi. We don't know how things are going to work out that Jimmy Butler has swapped himself out for Al Horford and Philly. The Wizards are still low. You get Oladipo back with, with the Pacers, but the Pacers just lost one of their 20-point scoring guys, and he's moved on to Utah. 
Miami is probably still looking for a second star to go with Jimmy Butler. Maybe they try to make a move next year in free agency where they're going to be a major player with the money that they have free. The East is open. You got to make, you got to make, I'm begging the table. You got to make this move if you're Detroit right now. I just, I don't get this, this idea that Russ is not a coveted player. Are you kidding me? There's 25 teams that would love Russ right now. Stop listening to these radio guys in the media who, who he's not a darling to. So they try to find every, every opportunity they can and they try to find every chance they, t- they can to take a shot at him and say guys don't want to play with him. I don't believe that Durant didn't want to play with him. I believe Durant got tired of being compared to LeBron and not getting his props. That's why he's leaving Golden State. And I love Durant. And I defend Durant. But, you know, it is what it is. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and it's got an Aflac commercial and it rides motorcycles for the pregame for a college football team, it's a damn duck. Simply put. And I'm just not buying that narrative, and I'm not going to buy that narrative. I think Russ is a great player. I think Russ is a great guy. And I think a city like Detroit can use a revitalizing, uh, a, a revitalizing, excuse me, a revitalizing guy to revitalize that that franchise. Detroit Pistons led the league in attendance at one point in the 2000s, guys. Like they, it's a it's a draw there. They're they're a, a team there that will draw their fans. But you got to put stars on the court. I uh, want to wrap up today's show, man. Great show today. Great stuff today. I want to thank my guest, Luis Estrada from Estrada Sports House on Blog Talk Radio. Make sure you guys go check him out. And also, I love to have Chris Sylvester on, the voice of Cal Poly Sports. A lot of freelance work with a lot of different other companies. And uh, has his own thing going with Pre- uh, Prep Sports Nation for high school football out here, which I do color commentary every Friday night for, along with freelancing for Fox Sports West. Uh, he's driving through the mountain somewhere. He told me he was going to be on the road, and I told him, please just make sure your windows are up and make sure you got good service. But this is what happens when you cut off the cereal box tops and you send them in for the free cell phone. You guys remember the free pager with YooHoo? Remember the chocolate drink YooHoo? That disgusting stuff that people used to drink and used to get the free pager from the label. If you tear the label off, you call Metro Call back in the day and get the free pager. I remember when cell phones first came out. When you get your flip phone, I remember the cereal box tops. But those are some of the worst cell phones in the history of mobile devices. And I think that's what my man... Uh, Chris Sylvester has so do want to thank him for the for the comments that he did give very insightful stuff hopefully we can get him on later this week and talk a little bit more in depth about uh Russ Westbrook and the Miami Heat if nothing else happens in free agency I am done with basketball I am done with free agency I am so on to high school football I am so on to college football and NFL football. It is going to be an outstanding season on all three levels. I'm looking forward to watching John Bosco, number one team most of the last year ranked in the nation. How do they bounce back from losing the state championship game against modern day? I'm looking to see how Thousand Oaks, Oaks Christian bounces back this year. Schools like Cal Poly, J. Sierra, DeMatha, Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas out in Florida, Hoover in Alabama, De La Salle up here in Northern California. We're looking to see if Michigan, my Wolverines, go blue, hell, hell, can bounce back from the debacle of how last year ended with a bowl game loss to Florida, the embarrassing loss at the Horseshoe to Ohio State. Can they finally get the championship and get to the playoffs? Can Nick Saban's team bounce back from the embarrassing loss against Clemson? Is Clemson just reloading? What's happening out here in the Pac-12? Can can my man, can uh, UCLA finally get things going with uh, with uh, Chip Kelly out here? What's happening with UCLA with JT Daniels at the quarterback position? They also get some transfer kids to come back home that were out in Florida. Uh, mainly number one, Chris Steele, which is a defensive back from John Bosco out here in Bellflower, California. He's back home. Kayvon Thibodeau was the number one player in high school. He decided to get away from home, get away from South Central, get away from Oaks Christian and go up to Oregon to play for the Mighty Ducks up there. Just big stuff in the NFL. Tom Brady's going to be 59 years old this year. Can he keep it going? Is Belichick going to pull another rabbit out of his hat? What's up with some of the younger players in the league? Can Saquon Barkley recap and redo what he did and do it even better, even better than what he did last year? The Oakland Raiders. 
Last year before they head out to Vegas, what's going to happen with AB in town? Can Gruden start to turn this ship around? People think the Bears are a major player. My Miami Dolphins are in full rebuild mode. I am completely okay with that. I'm not beefing at all. I'm tired of the MacGyver scotch tape work together, trying to just sign big players and put them in places. Start from the bottom again. Rebuild through the draft. Build up with the core that you have. Bring in good coaches and position coaches. Coach guys up fundamentally. Coach guys up to play smart, play hard. Get you a quarterback. Because in the NFL, high school, and college, if you don't have a quarterback, you have zero shot. You may be able to get away with it in middle school and in Pop Warner and Ankle Biters and the Snoop Dogg League. But on those other three levels, no quarterback. You have zero chance. Can the Steelers bounce back after using Le'Veon and A.B.? What's Le'Veon going to be with the Jets? Can some of these young quarterbacks bounce back? What's going to happen with the Houston Texans? They got a great defense. I bumped into Deshaun Watson at the gas station just two nights ago and said, what up to that young man? He was bumping gas out here training in L.A. Can he bounce back and have a better season this year? Continue to grow. What's going on up in Seattle? Russ, uh, Russ Wilson got the big money. He's laying in bed with Sierra. They put it out on Instagram and Twitter. He's paid now. They got matching G-Wagons and showing off big time up there. Got another addition to the family. Blessings to that man. What's going up there with Pete Carroll? Lost some of the big players on defense, some of the big names. Can he retool that defense? Aaron Rodgers is back and healthy. What's going to happen up there with him and Devontae Adams? He's got a new coach. I don't even think they've talked yet. That's one of my favorite guys. Aaron Rodgers is just like, man, just just hike the just line up and hike the damn ball. I don't need an offensive coordinator. I'm old school. I got this. I call my own plays like Dan Marino and Joe Name, Joe Theismann and Joe Namath and Terry Bradshaw used to be. I don't that's Roger Stall back too. Call his own plays. I don't need an offensive coordinator. I'm out here. I'm the one that sees what's going on. I'm the one that sees who's covering who and how fast this defensive back is and where this guy is and who's subbing in here and there. I'm making all the pre-snap reads. Just line up. Aaron Rodgers, that kind of guy. Put the ball down. Give me my 10 guys out here. You line up your 11 and let's go. And I'm going to bust your butt best I can. A lot of big storylines. Can the Atlanta Falcons uh, snap back? Cam Newton coming back from his shoulder injury. What's going on there? So much stuff that's going to happen in this season in football. I can't wait. I might do a show later this week, but only if something is going to break with the NBA. Other than that, I am full on flesh onto football fantasy. I do 15, 20 fantasy leagues a year. I'm excited for fantasy to start back up. I'm, I'm just, I just, I can smell it, man. I can smell the fresh cut grass. I can smell the chalk being laid down. I can hear the ice being poured into the ice baths and the Gatorade buckets. I can hear the chin straps snapping. I can hear the the shoulder pads being strapped on. The sound of the jerseys being pulled over the pads. The whistles. The crowds. The fight songs. Homecoming. Just, oh my God, the rivalries. I am ready for football. And as a great rapper once said, in one of the best football movies ever made, Wildcats, starring Goldie Hawn from the 80s. If you have not seen this movie, you got to see this movie. One of the best lines in the theme song. It's the story of kings, better than diamond rings. That's why we're here to play football. I'm VJ Vernon Husky. This has been VJ's Unsportsmanlike Conduct. Appreciate you guys. Spreaker.com. Don't forget to catch us later. Podcasting on iHeartRadio. Hey, man, you guys enjoy the rest of your day. God bless. And always remember, if you can't be good, at least be good at it. Peace. I'll holler at you guys.